right, welcome everyone uh, in this uh, culture and commons webinar today in the February of uh, in the fourth of February. It's this webinar is organized by the Budapest uh, based Solidarity Economy Center, and it will be this center and its activities. It will be introduced by by Mark Ponsarva, who is a funding member of 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 this uh, organization and who will moderate the second. Uh, round table of this day. And then after I will quickly introduce and summarize the practicalities of this event today. And then right after we can start the first webinar with our invited guests. So Martin, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, so welcome everyone. As Krzysztof said, this event is organized by the Solidarity Economy Center Budapest and funded by the European Cultural Fund, Strengthening European Solidarity Fund. Uh, we established the Solidarity Economy Center in 2019 to facilitate of making of cooperatives and other um, institutions of economic democracy. And while in some fields like housing and agriculture and care and energy, we made or we had been making quite a progress in the field of culture such a systematic movement making is lacking. Uh, so, and among culture workers who experienced quite a significant downward mobility coupled with authoritarian turn in Hungary. In the last couple of years, the thinking about ownership and utilization of culture in anti-systemic movements can be quite frightening as it evokes some kind of threat of losing their imagined autonomy. And we will be speaking about this autonomy issue hopefully a lot on this webinar and also like participation in political movements, which is based on voluntary work. Uh, is kind of also threatening their, their livelihood as it pushes them into a quite precarious situation. So we want to use the opportunity of this webinar to think together with people who are engaged with the idea of solidarity, economy, cooperativism, commons and equal access to culture in a structured way on how to provide institutional answers to different crises which hit the culture sector in the last couple of years or more like decades, uh, and also its workers. Uh, and so we would be engaging with the, with the crisis of housing, social reproduction, and unequal access caused by uh, commodification and marketization and also, as I mentioned, the growing ideological control of different authoritarian states. So we will be inquiring how these institutions in the field of culture, which are in line with the principles of economic democracy, can make a response to these questions. And uh, the structure of this evening will be the following. So between 4 p.m. and 5.30, We'll be speaking mostly about the theory of the commons. This will be moderated by Krzysztof Nagy, who is an editor of Fordula, a critical social scientific journal based in Budapest. And then after a short 30 minutes break, we'll be engaging with the challenges and possibilities of commoning in practice. And uh, this will last from 6 to 7.30. And uh, I wish everyone a fun and interesting evening, and I give the floor to Krzysztof. Yeah, thank you very much. Just a couple of more practical stuff. Yeah, as you can see, uh, for this uh, webinar, we invited primarily, not only, but primarily guests from, from the cent our Central Eastern Europe region, uh, not only, or not because uh, there isn't other exciting or important cultural commoning movements around the world, but we feel that uh, it would be interesting to learn more about each other in the region and about, yeah, about share our shared experience and to realize that these, ex uh, these experiments are not just coming from, from the West, but yeah, they are really uh, also granted locally. Yeah, uh, two more practical stuff. I wanted to ask you to mute yourself, but I was just checking everyone and everyone is muted, so it's brilliant. Thank you for that cooperation. Uh, in the first uh, roundtable, will be one. The first roundtable will be one and a half hours long, and after an hour, I would like to open it up for questions. 
And uh, so if you have any questions, uh, you can already uh, write it into the chat box or after when I open it up for the audience, please uh, raise your hand and, and then we could make a, a, an order. That would be really nice. Uh, yes. Uh, and we are also recording this or streaming this event via Facebook. And we will also uh, share the recordings in, in YouTube from, from tomorrow. And, and we plan to put together a Hungarian white paper based on this webinar for the spring. So it will somehow uh, cover and collect best practices, which I hopefully we will touch also today. And not only best practices, but also general dilemmas and questions. Uh, and I think that's all that I have to say uh, from the practical side. And so it's time to turn towards the conceptual uh, side. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers uh, from today. It's, they are Lamenta Poyat, Katarina Savic, Katja Frazlik, and Igor Pokfiserski. Uh, so we have four guests, and I will moderate this for roundtable. And uh, as a start, I would like to ask you to briefly introduce yourself and not only yourself but also your organization if it's a relevant question uh, for, for our webinar and I would like to be also be happy to hear a bit about your personal motivation so what motivates you in working for our cultural common so why uh, Igor could you start it Okay, uh, hello to uh, everyone. Thank you, Christoph uh, and Martin, for the introduction. Uh, okay, so my name is Igor Stokwiszewski. Uh, I am uh, a researcher, an activist, and artist working in the domains of political and community arts and uh, theater. And since uh, nearly 20 years, I am co creating an organization in Poland, which is called Krytyka Polityczna. Uh, political critique, uh, where I hold responsibility for different fields, but also for our cultural um, uh, cultural researches and uh, activities. And uh, um, well, in regards to the uh, personal motivation, I would like to say that um, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I had a uh, I had a experience of uh, being uh, involved in the movements of the squares in 2011, especially in Spain, but also in Greece. So I went for a, not very typical for, a, for an activist from Central and Eastern Europe way. And of course, the issue of uh, commons was ex extremely relevant at the time in the, uh, in the squares movement. And it was quite illuminating for me to understand that this perspective of the uh, commons can um, uh, can somehow describe the reality of the social production against the the state and the market. It was extremely illuminating, and I was working with the issue of the commons in the in the context uh, of culture for many many years, uh, or for the recent decade. But at the same time, I think that we are meeting in a very uh, interesting moment to discuss the the question of the culture and the uh, commons because of the uh, political and social transformations in the recent years and because of the uh, practices we have uh, implemented in regards to commons in the uh, recent years, I think we are in the moment where uh, it is worth discussing what did work, what did not work and what, what are the contradictions and uh, conflictual cases in regards to developing the uh, both the practices and the discourses over over the commons. So I am really excited to uh, to be here. Thank you for uh, your kind invitation, and uh, let's see what happens. Katarina, would you like to continue? Of course. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and um, uh, really, really nice to see people, so many people behind the screen uh, at the same time. So I'm Katarina. Um, I'm currently living in in UK in London, but I'm actually spent most of my professional life in Zagreb, Croatia. Um, I'm a Dalmatian by birth. Um, I'm a freelance currently cultural worker and researcher uh, with experience in activism around topics of governance of the commons in culture, but also beyond the cultural sphere. Um, 
I, I worked in Croatia and other ex yugoslav countries on enabling conditions uh, for peer-to-peer -peer collaborations between independent cultural organizations. The most prominent example of, of this uh, is the organization called Clubture Network. Um, it's a collaborative platform in Croatia whose main program is to foster direct collaboration between independent cultural collectives and at the same time, it is a self-regulatory mechanism in decision-making and distribution of funds for those collaborative projects. So it is a kind of an ongoing experiment in, in commoning of culture. The organization will be 20 years old next year. And I've been the uh, overall co coordinator of it for a total amount of nine years. Um, so, Recently, I, I moved away a bit from practical work into the research. Uh, my research uh, mainly revolves around political economy and material reality of culture. Uh, recently, I've been looking into application of uh, participative governance models of six different public cultural centers in Zagreb, Croatia. And now, currently, these days, I'm at the beginning of a new undertaking where I'm about to take a look into the complexity of public provision for independent culture in Croatia in the 20 year span. So it will be a bit of a yeah, larger undertaking for a public provision for independent culture, which is a contradiction of a kind, but not actually in our context. So what brings me to, to this table, I guess, uh, my main interest is in commoning the public sphere. So uh, I know that there is a part of the commons that comes from the position of autonomia, but I'm more of a maybe a Gramscian approach. The position is about democratizing the exist with the existing tools and involving those who might not be our usual suspects, especially in terms of cultural audiences, but more of a, you know, uh, people that we don't usually uh, include in the public cultural sphere, like uh, people from the neighborhoods, ordinary workers, immigrants, especially Britain here um, uh, after the crisis. But now I live in the UK, so the immigrant is a kind of a moving target, like a renewing target in this in this field. So that's for the motivational part. Thank you very much, uh, Katarina. May I ask you, Katja to continue it? Yes, hi everyone, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm also very delighted to be part of this panel and these discussions. Um, so um, I'm, a, I'm a sociologist by, by training now, uh, and I used to be an independent cultural worker in Slovenia. I currently work in the US in, at the University of Buffalo in, in the arts management program. And um, one, of the, one of the things that actually, I think, bring me to this panel and to this table is the fact that I am very interested in the labor issues in the arts. Uh, and I think that I approach the topic of the commons precisely through this uh, viewpoint. Uh, and um, I have written a number of articles and now books on, on the subject of, which I like to call the paradox of unpaid labor. And, uh, why labor in the arts is usually perceived as something special and not paid and so on. Um, and um, the, so my motivation, right, for, for the commons and for all these issues, in fact, of unpaid labor stems from, uh, uh, from this very simple principle. And I'm going to say something that may sound blasphemous right now, since I'm such a huge uh, uh, critic of creativity. Uh, but um, in fact, I do believe that, um, that we as people and everyone has the capacity for, uh, or is creative, that has the capacity to create. And, uh, uh, or maybe I should say that we all have this capacity to design and to conceptualize and that there are just different uh, methods on how we do so. So uh, more so I'll say that uh, there is an aspect of Western idea of art um, that has an emancipatory ethos in the sense that it defies the norms, that it communicates in very idiosyncratic ways 
uh, and has the power to expose aspects of our society and social life that are not always visible, right? But of course, art as a practice has its history and has its very problematic institutions and has very problematic ways of how it is institutionalized. And um, when we look at it from the labor point of view, uh, there, the, um, I think that this brings us back uh, into the question of how art and cultural practices are in fact something that belongs to all the people. And so for that reason, I am very invested in demystifying the arts, uh, and, but not in order to abolish it or to say that it's irrelevant, but quite the contrary, because I think that art, uh, uh, is something that should be accessible to everyone, that it is an, an extremely important uh, practice, uh, as in, especially in these non-normative uh, aspects of it. And so I'm, I'm very committed to making these kinds of experiences available, accessible, attainable to everyone, which of course then means to people who want to practice it professionally, to people who want to participate uh, and uh, also, I'm very um, uh, in, um, interested in what ways uh, the, do the capitalist structures also um, um, limit these uh, possibilities of culture and art being something, uh, some kind of common. So I'll say that for, for now. Thank you very much for your introduction. And last but not least, I would like to ask Levanta to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Levente, Levente Podiak, and I'm speaking from Budapest right now, which is, uh, I guess, uh, something that became my home in the last one year. And before that, I was in Italy for, for quite a few years, and, and that actually gave me a lot of insight into another idea of, uh, of the commons, or at least uh, an idea of the commons as, a, as a, an economic logic, but also logic that can be used for a lot of other things. Um, I'm originally, I, I was studying architecture and, and, and sociology and urbanism, so I'm not speaking from the, the viewpoint of culture, but I, especially in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was very involved in, in local uh, cultural scene. Uh, and then um, in the last years, I've been working a lot with my organization called the Eutropian, uh, that is based partly in Rome, partly in Vienna and in Budapest. We've been working a lot on helping local initiatives, mostly in the field of let's say urban regeneration, non-speculative uh, uh, real estate development. Um, so urban dynamics uh, with bottom-up initiatives or community-led initiatives now. And then of course, culture is part of this and culture learns a lot from this, uh, this uh, uh, dynamics. And also uh, cultural initiatives teach a lot of other uh, actors more in social fields or more in maybe other fields uh, about how to maybe think about the commons, how to th think about the, the distribution and, and sharing of resources differently, decision-making differently. So I guess, and, and of course, I, I don't like necessarily these very, very strong barriers between what culture is and what culture is not. Uh, but I guess we will probably talk about this a little bit more. And I'm, I'm really uh, thankful to Katarina that she mentioned Klapture because, because uh, 15 years ago I, I met uh, Dea Vidovic uh, that uh, she introduced me to the whole Klapture and, and then also what came after or what came on the top of it as, as, as methods also to, to, um, to collaborate in a, in a given scene and beyond in distributing resources, making decisions, etc. And I, I feel like in the last few years, I've, I've learned a lot from this logic as well. And when we work, for example, nowadays, we work uh, with my organization a lot with municipalities uh, across Europe. And also we're trying to help them exchange knowledge between them, but also learn to understand better their local civic society. And, and in a way, uh, uh, use, let's say, uh, learn a little bit logics of of of, uh, of developing space for collaboration that is not competition. And I think in, in in today's cultural field and civil society in general, we're often in a very competitive uh, uh, mode uh, that we coexist. And I'm I'm learning a lot, for example, these kind of uh, collaborative commissioning ideas and all these kind of things. Uh, in order to think about broader logics for how different actors can collaborate in the city. But I guess we will go more into details later. So this is my, my entrance here. 
Thank you very much for, for all of your use. I think in your introductions, you've touched extremely important topics and I was making notes that you mentioned the labor aspect of culture and social movements and state and municipalities and also community makings. And I think these will definitely four of our focal points in this round table. So I think the central topics are already raised in this introductory round. Uh, but first of all, I would like to start a bit of historical question. So uh, I think it's exciting or important to ask uh, whether does it make sense to think about the social history of the cultural commons? Uh, does it make sense to look to the history of our region, uh, either to the pre-war uh, radical social visions of culture as the tool of of changing society or to the state socialist period, which also tried to democratize art uh, without success or with partial success. It could be also debated. So my question is that, uh, does it make sense to find uh, historical precursors for our uh, commoning ideas and commoning projects? Or if yes, what are these historical precursors? Or we should rather focus on the future and these historical uh, stories are not teaching so much for us. And now I let you speak. Maybe I can start if uh, nobody um, wants to. I want to share something uh, uh, with you because um, I am very interested how it works um, in your context, but um, uh, what happened in uh, uh, in Poland in regards to history as a possible resource for the emancipatory action towards legitimizing of the commons was that, um, well, I belong to the uh, generation of uh, activists, intellectuals who are trying to, uh, to uh, uh, revitalize the idea of um, of the left after the collapse of uh, communism and for many years we were trying also to work with the with the communist past uh, as a as something uh, positive and also pre-communist past or let's say the pre second world war um, uh, leftist um, uh, ideas and discourses and uh, on the one hand, we, for us, it was really a kind of emancipatory uh, resource and a kind of a pattern from which we could, um, uh, we could, which we could use. On the other hand, there was an element of provocation there because, of course, it was uh, the issue of communism twenty years ago was not really a good issue. But uh, with time, uh, what we see in regards to the, uh, to the uh, social response to those efforts, we see that those discourses, they do not find uh, social uh, legitimacy, that it is something which doesn't really work, that it is culturally provocative, it's intellectually provocative, but when we think about the political space, it doesn't really resonate with the, with the communities, with the, uh, with the people. So what, uh, what is happening uh, in the recent uh, few years, at least in Poland, what we observe is a, uh, is a turn towards the counter-cultural uh, le uh, legacy which is quite interesting. So the legacy of the uh, counterculture of the 70s or late 60s, early 70s. And uh, we are somehow on the emancipatory on, or on the progressive uh, scene, uh, cultural scene. We are somehow trying to deal with this legacy and try to uh, uh, appropriate it to the uh, emancipatory, um, let's say, perspectives. So uh, it's interesting to, to see that, um, that what we thought would be a natural alliance, historical alliance with the pre-Second World War leftist past and the communist past does not really work in a social, 
and political space. And it is interesting to observe how we are trying to appropriate a little bit different traditions, which in this particular case is counterculture of the 60s and the 70s. But it's still a big question whether we will be able to uh, do it. But this is the historical experiment we are dealing with now. Yeah, so I wanted to, to say something about these uh, historical precedents because I think they are important, uh, as Igor mentioned, uh, and it's very interesting, Igor, what you say about the fact that they are not necessarily helpful in contemporary struggles, but I do think that they are important because I think that um, we are an interesting group of people coming from this so-called East European right context, uh, looking from the, the other side of the Atlantic and also with, with the experience of a socialist past. So I think that um, at least in my work and I think for the way I, I, I'm, I'm trying to talk about art as something that should be accessible or as a, you know, as something that is related to the, uh, to the commons, I think that this past is the, extremely important. I don't think that I would have such a view of the arts and culture was I not raised or born in socialist Yugoslavia. Uh, and I agree that this legacy of socialism is, of course, not neither black nor white. There are many shades of gray. I think we could also have a very interesting conversation among the five of us because we come from different socially. I mean, Katarina and um, I, myself, we come from the same country, but the rest of you don't. Uh, and so I think that this, um, this um, history is important. Uh, and I think that what we need to be aware of is that this history is trying to be delegitimized, de right? And that is something that we are ha we have to fight against in our own context. So in these uh, post-socialist uh, regions uh, and beyond them, right? That uh, the socialism has become the, the dirty word or the problematic word and uh, for, for different people and for different reasons. And I, but nevertheless, I think that this history is important, right? Because I think that especially in on the Balkan Peninsula in the pre-war, right? Pre-World War time, uh, there were many artists who were um, deeply, uh, uh, deeply involved in the social change. Uh, and, and they have, especially in the Yugoslav context, contributed a lot to this idea of democratizing culture. Of, uh, uh, they have been very important, especially all these historical avant-garde movements uh, and people who have tried to demystify the Western ideas of art and were trying to um, implement a different version of art or culture in, in the Yugoslav context, again, there can be a discussion of how successful they were in these attempts. Uh, nevertheless, um, I think that um, their ideas of art and culture as something that is common and something that should be available and accessible to all the people has been extremely important. And I think that perhaps these uh, kinds of discussions are too academic -y. Uh, for um, for uh, for contemporary struggles, but I think that we need to um, that it is on us to maintain uh, the importance of that legacy and importance of that history, right? Even if we cannot necessarily use it, I think we can learn from it. I personally have learned a lot from from the fact that I went and looked at how, for instance. Yugoslavia tried to understand art as labor and uh, how, how, how that affected accessibility of art. Uh, and of course there were many problems, but nevertheless, when you try to analyze and see, I think that this can inform our practice, even though uh, I understand that for certain reasons, um, people have a lot of um, resistance towards it in, in our own context, because I think um, yeah, because of this, the de de uh, the liberal delegitimization of of the socialist past. Maybe I can just add a bit to the complexity, maybe of the of the Yugoslav particular situation. It was also funny because in your question we we got them in, in written beforehand, and I read pre-war and it was like which war? Uh, because there are so many wars. But, and of course, I was born in the 80s, so for me, it was the last Yugoslav war. And the pre-war culture is that culture for me in my, in my you know, immediate surrounding and my memories. So what, um, to add 
Katya said a lot, so I don't want to be very, I will be very brief about it. But what's interesting, uh, what's an interesting uh, lesson for me here, and I do call myself like a historical materialist. So what else should we study? And especially, you know, in social studies. But for me, it's, it's interesting to see how the in, in Yugoslav project uh, culture was uh, a vital part of social transformation towards a classless and stateless society. And it was a kind of a paradox in itself because it mainly introduced a lot of infrastructure for culture via the state, uh, envisaged by the, by the Communist Party, uh, but also in its cracks and in, it, in, it, in opaque spaces of gray zones, there was a lot of very subversive and ideologically contrasting culture. So that's very, very interesting, enticing even, you know, not just intellectually, but also as a, as a place for activism. So what can emerge, what can ferment in those cracks and gray zones of these grand visions and despite those grand visions? So maybe the lesson is that transformations happen, but sometimes they diver diverge from what was designed, you know, by the, by the ones who were sitting on the high places. Yeah, a few words also uh, for, my, for me on this. Um, two things come to my mind, and one is that uh, maybe you, 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 you followed it as a few months ago, Ursula von der Leyen kind of announced the new Bauhaus, which I find quite, uh, well, quite an interesting idea that uh, kind of the new European development priorities would follow the new uh, kind of Bauhaus, which has uh, environmental consciousness and beauty and all kinds of stuff, which is of course very far. And of course, it's very easy to say you build on, on something like the Bauhaus, but it's in many, many cases, it's very far from that. But uh, what is maybe more interesting for me is a little bit to look at all these, uh, maybe not from the Leyen's remark, but all the all these cultural movements, a little bit also in relationship with their, with their economic context. And, and when I look at, for example, Italy, where, where I spent really the last decade almost entirely. Um, of course, when you look at look back at the, the you know, um, social economy movements, the cooperative movements, or Italy or in Spain, there's of course a lot of continuity and there's a lot of uh, lot of uh, precedents to build on. There are structures, there are maybe even you know, there's a financial infrastructure around that, that is maybe every now and then it comes back in cycles. So what I see is that a lot of these ideas are, 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 are reborn every, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 years. Um, then they lose uh, their power, their force, because they become forms that are empty a little bit of, of, of content. And, and for example, in Rome, where I lived, uh, cooperatives became in a way, the the perfect vehicles for corruption, because because somehow they were, you know, they were all used to channel public public money into private hands. So there's no format that guarantees you the kind of economic democracy that that you want. But if you have the you know the public interest behind the public, not meaning the public uh, as a state, but if you have the public interest behind, and if you have the the right discourse and the right movements behind them. Again, they are they will be filled with 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 content. These, these forms, the forms are there every now and then. Um, I also don't like so much this Eastern Europe, Western Europe, um, uh, you know, dichotomy because I think Europe is also a much more diverse place than than just two options. Even even between us, as you as you mentioned, there's a lot of difference in in in, in Yugoslavia and Polish. Uh, socialism and living in southern europe you you realize that that's also very very different in many many senses than than, than northern northern europe and um so for me the most interesting thing is really how these movements are embedded also in, in an economic movement or a, a logic of creating accessible spaces creating accessible services products you know jobs uh, fair payment fair salaries uh accessible finance, all these things that are in a way, you know, also create the context for, for an artistic production, uh, more or less. And when it comes to Hungary, I think uh, pr probably very similarly to Poland, but even more, I think it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to take up any socialist legacy. But if we look at a lot of experiments in the 60s, 70s, there were a lot of experiments for for cultural commoning, they were you know isolated. They were islands. 
but there were there was space so you could create your space for 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 uh, pretty much autonomous uh, cultural experimentations and that had different conditions or different requirements i guess than than today where i guess probably it's still uh, with certain different conditions it's still possible to create your island like experimentation but again you need to set up a different kind of uh, economic infrastructure for that today. Uh, while in, in the 70s, I guess you need to be safe, not so much from the forces of the, the market, but from, from political forces. I guess that's partly back today, but uh, in politics and the market is so much intertwined today in Hungary that it's difficult to say which one is oppressing you more. Uh, thank you very much. We will definitely touch the interrelation of economic infrastructure and cultural infrastructure later. But now I would like to follow up on another remark of Levante when you mentioned that the format is, is not a guarantee for, for anything. And I was thinking about the role of, of community in making commons or in commoning, because yeah, on the one hand, there is a very direct even etymological uh, relation between the two terms. And uh, commons are really often defined as uh, social economic orders that are serving communities. But on the other hand, community is not necessarily uh, a no hierarchical uh, form of social organization, and community could be also uh, served similarly, just like the family form, which really often hides the internal unevenness. So I would like to ask you uh, about the possible roles of communities in commoning and how could we avoid the, any romance of community in this in these struggles, because these are definitely struggles. Katja, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I want when when you send that question, uh, my uh, my first thought was that it is precise, it reminded me of this romanticization of art and the community, right? So I think that one of the most important aspects when we think about the community and the role of communities is that we need to pay attention that these are not some classless groups of people, homogenized, right? Homogeneity of communities, I think is something we should be really weary of. And that that's this, the romanticized view that there's this happy community, which is gonna do everything together, but, um, as we already touched upon, right? The, the, the material reality, the economic reality of different people is extremely important to pay attention to when we think about commoning because the commoning is right. I would say that the commoning is the fight against the, the, the oppressive structures of commodification, uh, marketization and so on, especially today. And so I think that when we think about the community, it is, really important to keep this class certification and differences between the people because we cannot work on working on cultural commoning uh, and communities without this awareness of i would say interclass interracial interethnic solidarities right because if we don't understand that we are different even though we want to be uh, united in some in, in in a positive way or in a social change that these differences are extremely important. And it also then is also the question of where do we put our focus on, right? You mentioned the, um, uh, so what can be an ideal of, of some emancipated, liberated community uh, uh, where we are very different, where we have very different material conditions, where we have very different privileges or we are deprivileged in certain aspects. So I think that when we talk about communities and commoning, this is one of the most important things we need to be, we need to pay attention to. Yeah. To that, I would add the need to be very practical about things. Like when we talk about community, we t talk about uh, certain needs of certain groups of people. So what do we need? Do we need a, a space to become more accessible for people with disabilities? Now I'm completely banalizing it, but things can really be presented in a practical way. Do we need those different people to be able to produce something somewhere? So by, by tackling concrete questions, we kind of avoid pitfalls of not just romanticizing things, but making things you know, absurd. Um, I, had, um, I had a couple of observations uh, a couple of years ago when I was a, uh, 
researching a project about culture and homeless people here in London. Um, homelessness is soaring here. It's it's in abysmal Victorian proportions. And I no noticed uh, one interesting thing that cultural organizations approach homelessness either as a, a kind of a entrepreneurial thing, they will give skills, but Katya would love this, skills to these people to become you know, reserve workforce, more employable, so they will know how to, you know, draw something or be more employable. And the other thing is like religious, cultural, religious, like opium for masses, like beautiful, oh, when you enter this art space, you are not a homeless person, you are enjoying the, you know, beautiful arts. So there was nothing, mostly nothing between those two positions. So either is it, you know, being completely devoid of any real meaning, what can culture and art give to, to people who are currently in, in bodily precarious situations. So for me, it was about becoming really practical. Um, what do we need about these, these people do not need pottery lessons in situations where do, they do not have any perspective for their lives. So as cultural workers, we need to really be practical about not for, you know, falling into a complete obsolete questions of, you know, what is community, but actually engaging people who live around us on very concrete questions. Uh, I would like to approach this question, which I find really relevant and uh, exciting from maybe another angle, uh, because um, my observation about the dynamics of uh, communities and the commons is the following one that uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we were really excited to discover the, uh, the power of local communities in Poland. And uh, probably it's a big difference to uh, what we can find in Southern Europe, but in countries like Poland, uh, the uh, local communities were not strong, were not very strong for many years uh, because also of uh, mass migrations in uh, after Second World War. So the link to to the uh, to the local space was not really so strong so to discover that there is a link and that there are local communities uh, with which uh, one can work also uh, in the sense of um, uh, of the political production because they have a agency over this little space um, they live in it was quite uh, amazing but with the development of the discourses and practices uh, in regards to communities uh, what we have observed or what we have witnessed uh, or experienced was uh, also the dark side of the communities, uh, which means that the communities uh, transformed also into uh, entities they want, that want to have control over inclusion and exclusion of individuals and groups, over you know, controlling the, the issues of, uh, I don't know, violence and so on and so on. And also, it um, simultaneously, what we observed in Poland was the rise of the uh, middle class and the discourse, uh, let's say, a kind of an authoritarian discourse. And uh, this is probably um, and the combination of the, uh, the community, the middle class, and that authoritarian discourse is something what uh, more or less uh, contributed to a political situation in Poland. Uh, there was a research a couple of years ago uh, on the uh, on uh, people who were electing, who were voting for law and justice party, so the one which is uh, ruling Poland since uh, six years. And uh, it was quite clear that they, they have a need. It's a, it's a middle class who has um, a very strong uh, community identity. The community they identify with is the nation. And they want to have power over inclu inclusion and exclusion from the nation, and so on, so on. So very authoritarian um, uh, social tendencies. So probably uh, what we are trying to experiment uh, now uh, with is rather uh, work on differences and not commonalities. So when we think about commonalities and the community, um, uh, and when we think about uh, differences, what we come up with is the question of solidarity. 
indeed. So not community, but solidarity. How to, how to create open communities which are based on solidarity with the ones who are different from them and not, uh, not beside they are different, but precisely because they are different. So this is probably a challenge and a mechanism we, we will try to experiment with for the next years. I would pick up on, on Igor's comment that uh, communities can be bad as well. So there's no, the community is not a recipe in itself for, you know, salvation. Uh, I also, when lived in different, different places, uh, for example, in Rome, in my neighborhood, there was a, a very strong, even formal uh, neighborhood committee, which is really dominated by some people who had been there for 20, 30 years. And it was absolutely not democratic, absolutely hierarchical absolutely no voice for a lot of people that uh, that wanted to contribute and wanted to give in but just a few hundred meters further there was another committee which worked in a very different way much more open but also on its other hand that other uh, neighborhood com committee was much more maybe open to business that this first committee saw as a neoliberal uh, you know uh, mutation or diversion uh, while they were actually in in, in their rhetorics communist and uh, in the rhetorics everything was there except that it was a super hierarchical and very exclusive little community so and the same thing in 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 budapest in a way i i 10 years ago started a little facebook group in a, in a neighborhood that since then became a kind of a, a battlefield between nightlife tourism and uh, people who want to live there and people who want to work there uh, and originally, this was a kind of a, a situation where we felt that we can come to a, a common understanding of what is needed in this neighborhood. You know, we could combine online and offline things. And there was a little bit of a sense of a community. And this is very, very fragile because the first moment when we realized that there is a conflict in between that we cannot, I don't have a recipe for, I don't have a solution. And nobody really has, nobody really has a solution. It's, they, they have solutions for their own needs, but not, uh, but this, they, they are very, very different from the other's needs. So the whole thing started polarizing and, uh, and then it became really a, a very, very nasty battlefield that temporarily COVID solved in a, in a, in a, in a very surprising way. But what, I, what I'm trying to say is that the local community is one thing and, and, and the community that maybe subscribes to a set of rules, a set of rules that in a way allow them to share their resources, give up some, some privileges, uh, put some of the things in the common, uh, but also with, with this maybe protecting themselves uh, on the long term or protecting each other on the long term for, from certain things. That's again another thing. So. I guess when we talk about community, it's, it's, it's one thing to talk about geography, but it's very much about this kind of sharing an idea of how to, how to, how to make decisions, sharing an idea how to, um, how to um, yeah, distribute resources. And then we come to a community that is connected to the commons. Otherwise we can have a community that is a, that is a radical, uh, that is a fascist community that is uh, you know, finding it's uh, lost family in the notion of the nation or a, a million other things. So I guess it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a connection between the two things that is not always there. Thank you very much for your answers. After, after crushing the idea of, of community or community in itself, I would like to turn towards another uh, debatable question, the question of, of, of individual passion or emotional relation to art and culture, that is, I think, in a lot of sense, it's a similar uh, phenomenon. Uh, and not only in culture, but I think also real often social activism is fueled by a, a emotional, strong emotional bonding and some strong emotional involvement. And at the same time, this uh, deep emotional engagement really often strengthens the precariousness or self-exploitation, I think the field, not only in the field of culture, but also in the field of, of political activism too. So my question is that how can we, on the one hand, uh, keep our emotional involvement, because I think it's important to somehow keep our emotional involvement in these issues and not to become the technocrat of culture or the technocrat of politics, but at the same time, how can we rethink this emotional bonding or emotional involvement towards culture? Uh, 
but we are also trying to question or uh, uh, struggle against this capitalist logic of exploitation. So how can these two come together? Tough question, I don't know the answer, so I hope you know. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I'm sorry. No, Igor, go, go, go. In fact, Katya, I will uh, let you in in 30 seconds because what I wanted to share with you is that, in fact, I have no idea. Since more than 20 years, I am trying to discover how to not become a technocrat and at the same time not to um, produce a permanent self-exploitation. And I have no idea. Well, I, I mean, I know that I have a solution. I don't think I have a solution. I just have one proposition that I've been uh, working on for now years, uh, which is that I think that one of the most important things is when we do these kinds of things is that um, the fact that we are passionate and, uh, uh, and, and right, that these are things that matter to us, the, the way the language around it is built, I think is important. I think that we can start there, right? An analysis of how um, the way things are defined actually limits our then, um, or can help us understand the, the, where the exploitation comes from. So, um, and, and, and as you mentioned, I, I do make this comparison between housework or mm, domestic labor and artistic labor because they are both kind of essentialized. And I think that this is the key, or this is one way of how we can approach this problem is that we need to avoid these types of essentialization because every time you essentialize something, you really also make it very vulnerable to exploitation in the capitalist context. And so, um, <clears throat> And you make certain things invisible, right? You make it invisible as work uh, in the context of art and, and domestic labor. And I think that when we come to culture, what is really interesting is that while this comparison between domestic and artistic labor is, let's say, to a certain extent obvious and the, 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 the parallels are obvious, but the difference, differences, I think, are also important. Because um, if on one hand, when we think about domestic labor, right? Um, there's a, another, there's kind of, a, it's essentialized in this collective undifferentiated sexual difference, right? Which is supposed to be the origin of why women are um, inclined to care and so on and so on. Uh, and the, women are not inscribed into this housework, uh, emotional labor, labor of love in order to distinguish themselves. On the other hand, artists are, right? So when we deal with essentialization of artistic labor as stemming from this creative genius and our creativity and so on and so on, it is to distinguish ourselves, right? So there's an element of individualism uh, that, that goes with it, that makes it really hard, I think, to untangle these kinds of uh, um, uh, artistic labor from exploitation. And I would say that political activity has a similar tendency, right? It is, uh, it is, uh, it's something that is um, um, something that we do, right? It's something that we do without thinking and it has a positive effect. We don't think about doing art or doing political work as, a, as, as being oppressed as we do when we do, uh, let's say, house chores and all kinds of caring work. And so I think that the essentialization can be perceived as positive, and that is part of the problem, right? When your emotional labor becomes essentialized and it becomes part of you, it can have a positive effect in terms of your own motivation, but it can have negative structural effects in terms of how you can, because of that, then be exploited. So I think that um, that there's 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 this labor perspective that I think is useful when we talk about these things. So maybe I'll just add that for now. Maybe just a few few words on what, what I think is seems to be maybe the key is is uh, to not be left alone to do things when you are you feel that you are alone doing things and and I think it's kind of imagining a, a mutual you know aids or help network that is. That that uh, is because I think a big part of this whole, especially in, in the arts 
context, I guess, where, where you certain things you cannot simply share because because in a way it's it's uh, it's your thing, and it's uh, uh, I think in the art world it's it's very paradoxical. It's it's a very individualist world where you uh, you know you use your name as a label for things that even if you you you're making up in the end collectives, I guess it's 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 very important that. Who one thing is coming from, and I guess it's 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 a very very big weight on you because certain parts of your your work and activity you cannot share it. So of course I don't have the solution, but I I I, I feel that once you have a, a, a mutual aid network where you can share a lot of the things that you are, are on you, I guess things are become a little bit maybe less self exploitative. But that's just a, that's just an impression. Yes, I, I think it's very hard and everyone has kind of concluded that for me, it's important to cultivate the other. So uh, it's just sticking all the guns into this one aim that can be very, very bad. I think this is also for a collective work um, where people really get lost in what needs to be done. And uh, you know the, the oppression is always uh, can sometimes be so hard on people that they get lost into cultivation of uh, their relationships, even with themselves. So I think there needs to be there needs to be time for cultivation of what is not and what is the other. And we often sacrifice uh, sacrifice that. And yes, and often, uh, especially after I don't know decades have passed, uh, many people turn like, oh, what have I been doing? Uh, so getting getting the message on time that um, the, this otherness needs to be cultivated. I think it's very uh, important. And also I will again be boring. I think thinking in concrete terms because we are as you know as thinkers, we tend to be very abstract. So this is like a playground for getting lost, you know, not seeing the forest because of the because of the trees. So what is it that I need to really do today that you know, makes the difference in today's situation. So I know this sounds like some kind of, you know, self-help, but sometimes, you know, actors in this field need self-help. I wanted to add one more thing to this because I think that part of self-care is also understanding the, the nature of your oppression, right? I mean, and, and this invisibility of, of these kinds of things that we do, um, uh, or in visib of the way they are not perceived as work, I think is really important to understand because, um, right? I mean, that's why I think that the uh, that when when we essentialize things, we need to be careful about them, and and that, um, like you said um, earlier, um, um, Levant. Uh, right, it's very individualistic, but at the same time, like, where does this individualism stem from, right? The analysis is very important, even though it's abstract, I think, but uh, I don't think if we don't understand the, the, the context and the structures that oppress us, which are sometimes very abstract, uh, that it's hard to act. Uh, it's hard to act and it's hard to um, to go against them. And it's then also, I think, hard to think about it, right? Because I think that, let's say, if we talk about culture, right? The, um, the way we don't understand it as work also then is not really helpful in terms of policy, in terms of what we would want the state to do, what kind of uh, initiatives are we going to suggest, right? I think it's very important how we define these things when we are dealing with uh, exploitation in political terms, uh, because it's also then it helps us understand what kind of actions and what kind of policies we want to demand or we want to implement as I don't know, even in, in on terms of the collectives, right? Because artists are very often complaining how they are not paid or how, but it's when you ask them, why don't you organize or how do you organize and what is gonna be the, the point of organization to fight this exploitation, then, then we come to these issues, right? Uh, of defining, um, of defining the nature of our exploitation and, 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 and the structures that contribute to it, so.
Mm, thank you very much for your contributions on these questions that I think it's definitely a relevant, a relevant for questions for anyone dealing with culture or dealing with any kind of activism or yeah, having any kind of uh, occupational identity in general. So I think it's, yeah, it's a question that we um, avoid. Uh, we are slowly running out of the one hour after which I promise to open up the discussion for the audience. But before that, I would like to just to ask one more question. After that, if there is time, I have still have juicy questions in reserve on aesthetics of commons and autonomy of art and so on. But now I would like to ask uh, about the role of the state because yeah, Katya just mentioned that what do we want the state to do? And it's definitely, I think, a question that how do we want the state to do regarding uh, uh, culture and commons, uh, especially in Eastern Europe where cultural production is definitely, historically, definitely a state dependent. Uh, so uh, usually uh, different branches, uh, culture is related to different branches of state. Uh, and yeah, my question is that should we push the state for new policies uh, supporting cultural commons or even if we push the state, state will use commons and cooperatives somehow to externalize this reproductive labor, be it for the reproduction of, of the labor force, and uh, so how to how to deal with the state and what could be the strategy goals when we are approaching the state and how to uh, approach the state and maybe one more aspect that it could be worthwhile to think about the different levels of state so municipalities and the government central governments are functioning differently so how to uh, deal with this complexity of the state uh Maybe I can start because it's something uh, uh, at the moment or since a couple of years in Poland, of course, it's a very vital uh, discussion among culture makers and, uh, and uh, people of arts. And of course, at the moment, uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to preserve as much arts and culture from the state or against the, the, the state. And a, it's, it's a really uh, big struggle because the policies of uh, our government towards uh, culture is more or less uh, connected with taking over as many assets, institutions and so on as possible. Luckily, and it's a difference uh, uh, in comparison to uh, other countries in Europe with the authoritarian or quasi-authoritarian uh, political structures is uh, Poland is quite a large uh, country I mean also in regards to the administrative uh, structures uh, which means that um, it is quite decentralized uh, and there is a lot uh, really a lot of uh, political power in the hands of uh, municipalities and regions and other you know inter uh, structures so uh, at the moment i would say that uh, what we are experimenting with is to keep as much as possible out of the hands of the uh, central government in regards to culture but we are trying to build the alliances with uh, with uh, local governments and we are trying to find uh, a space where the uh, independent culture and let's say the um, yeah, the culture, which is the grassroots culture, the grassroots culture and manifestations are uh, in the dialogue with uh, uh, with uh, local governments in uh, in relationship to values, aims and dynamics of the uh, of the common uh, cultural uh, space. But I wonder what will be the uh, in fact, I, I really wonder what will be the future, because um, I am quite surprised with the fact that uh, although I come from the tradition of political arts and I have never thought about the autonomy of cultural production in a in a positive sense i also always thought that autonomy is really nothing uh, nothing positive now we are trying to rethink uh, the the notion of autonomy of cultural production the notion of autonomy of arts because of the political tendencies uh, in, in in our country so i wonder what will uh, come up with it and so as you can see we are trying to discuss everything the community the you know the autonomy of uh, arts and also the historical legacy of the progressive movements 
uh, well, but yeah, thanks. Maybe I can I can continue uh, giving some time. Um, I think it's it's interesting if you look at in in, in Budapest, for example, the uh, the Off Biennale, which is a uh, something that uh, I think it's, it's a great initiative that is trying to be outside of, of the public sphere in a way declaring that we cannot trust the public sphere because which is no longer objective in its in its uh, cultural subsidies. Uh, but then of course it has to reach out to, to the, the private sector and, and of course not every not all the private sector has interest in in uh, in uh, in uh, in subsidizing arts or, or paying or 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 maybe they have a lot of uh, you know requests in exchange. Not I don't think this is the case right now. But of course, on the long term, and probably we can learn a lot from from the, the from from Polish initiatives uh, or Croatian initiatives or or in general uh, ex Yugoslavian initiatives. That that uh, I guess we we need to push towards uh, some kind of like a common sphere that economically can also, you know, provide some space for, for the cultures. And, and uh, of course, you know, pushing the state means that uh, forcing the state to give up some of its own privileges or own uh, competencies or properties, which is a very difficult thing, of course, because you, you, there's a powerful actor and you want to convince this actor to give up some of its, uh, of its, uh, of its powers which is uh, not, not something a lot of, lot, of, uh, you know, lot of public actors would do. So there comes in the whole issue of, of why is it good for, for the state? And you know, I think it's much less for the state than, than the local state, as you mentioned, cities. So what we see that cities are much more interested in this whole idea than, than, than nation states, although, of course, most of the wealth is with the, with the nation states. Because cities can see that there's a lot of things they cannot cannot resolve. There's a lot of places in the city uh, that they cannot reach, and there's a lot of people who need some kind of care that they cannot. The the, the city itself cannot solve it. But there's a lot of people on the ground uh, who can actually do this, and the whole thing becomes much more direct and and uh, and much more organic if you if you provide a certain space where the resources uh, that in a way, make it possible to reach out the most vulnerable people can be reproduced with, within this realm that is the commons without having to go back into the central authority and having, you know, asking again the money and the resources and the, the authorization. So I guess it's a very, you know, of course, there, there are no recipes, but I think there's a lot of really interesting experiments in Europe around this. And we work with Turin, which has a lot of spaces, which are, I think, very important parts of the local social infrastructure. Of course, Barcelona, of course, a lot of cities have this kind of social infrastructure that is not city run, but the city has a, has a, has a, has a foot in it, but, uh, but also a lot of community actors or social actors have a foot in it. But for this, I think you, you really need uh, an authority or a state or a local state that is thinking in the long term either it is thinking about what happens if I won't be here anymore, so how can I create an infrastructure that can survive me, uh, but also can, can build some kind of collaboration on, 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 on trust that means that it's, we're not, when we move something out of the public sphere, we're not privatizing it. We are commoning it, which means that there will be, you know, a kind of a social control on this, but, uh, social control that will complement the kind of representative power control that I'm as an elected representative of a municipality can guarantee for that given resource or something. So I guess there's a, uh, just to summarize it up, I think there's a long way to, to go there because it, it requires a lot of trust and culture of, of collaboration. But I think we see in Europe a lot of, and beyond definitely, uh, a lot of initiatives and, and experiments which are actually very promising and work very well. Of course, everything, all these things are fragile. And this is why we need a legal environment that guarantees certain things. This is why we need an economic arrangement that guarantees certain things on the long term. So we can create kind of a, an autonomy, which of course needs the kind of initial resources, kind of needs the, the regulations between the different actors involved. But we, I think now we see a lot of lot of initiatives that are 
will be there for the next 90 years because this is how they are designed. And then if circumstances change radically, they can fall, but otherwise they, they have no reason to fall because a lot of building blocks are there and they are very, very stable. Uh, well, I, it's uh, very difficult to give any recipe what, you know, anything becoming too normative about such a complex question can only, you know, be disfavorable for any discussion, but uh, I think that cultural actors really need to uh, think about commoning in a very broad terms, and I can only bring examples from from my own experience, what I lived through in Zagreb, where cultural actors, independent cultural actors, started a relatively small struggle around spaces. And then it became really a political struggle involving different, different types of actors, uh, especially those early, early signs of, of a political movement were in making collaborations with the green movement. That was very important. Because now we have now these actors have seeded the seat for a for a green and left political party, which is in the parliament, uh, in a broader coalition. And uh, the next chapter are the second local elections, where there is a serious um, opportunity to form a coalition to actually govern the city. Uh, now I'm you know shooting for the stars, but there are early signs that. The, the outcome of these elections with a good campaign could be good, similar to the Barcelona um, 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 scenario, hopefully, of course. There is a lot to be done in the days, 100 days before the elections in Zagreb, and I'm not there, so maybe I'm not the, you know, the perfect candidate to talk about this, but it's very important. I know how the, build, how the movement has been built, and it started with culture. So we hadn't been, you know, adjacent to it or uh, jumped into the story led by, I don't know, someone else. We who are the ones, you, you know, the others were hoping for. So the push came um, from, from the question of independent culture that had no space uh, in the city. And then that relatively non-complex question that we need space for different kind of culture led us to thinking about how our space is being run and how our space is being, you know, manipulated as a speculative venue in the city, uh, you know, as the, as the ultimate price for political cronism. And that, that struggle led us to collaborate with the Green Movement and that uh, uh, in the next chapter, we collaborated with trade unions about, uh, Igor will remember about the question of privatization of motorways in Croatia. And that led us, so it was, uh, it was like a slow, 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 Again, I won't say march, but it was a really slow movement towards the change in the institutional politics. And the guys are now currently in parliament, I mean, working as a opposition party, but having a say, having uh, a lot to do, you know, with the laws, with, with concrete policies. And um, this is actually commoning of the public sphere, what you have mentioned. Uh, and what I said early on. So it's not a phrase, it's not like a, 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 it's not, again, it's a very practical thing. How do we get people involved? How do we get people, communities involved in questions? And how does that, you know, how is that not empty phrasing? So how do different people collaborate? Uh, what I mentioned earlier when I said being practical, when we worked with, uh, trade unions around motorways as cultural workers. We don't have anything in common with them, but we understand what is public, uh, what the you know, privatization of public good brings to culture. Because if the state is ready to privatize the, the highway, which is very material, they won't have any problem slashing all public funds for culture. So when you go there as a, as a cultural worker and say, roads matter to us and we don't want them private so in a in a quid pro quo logic in the next chapter you're going to have uh you know trade union is saying culture matters to all of us because we are a society even though we are not usual suspects when we sit together and this is because i am having a threat here maybe it's not completely logical from the onset but 
this broadening of the sphere to to you know non audiences because you know how people in culture we are all professional you know um, audiences of our colleagues. So for me, what the success is to kind of broaden this sphere of what culture is and how to bring people which are maybe ideologically different. Maybe if they come, you know, if we come together and start talking about what really matters to us, uh, we will come, you know, to a much greater understanding that we are not that different. Um, and this is uh, this is where I end. A lot more to say, but yeah. I, I wanted to I wanted to say that my idea is also uh, related to the fact that we need to reclaim the state. Right? Is that I think. Um, one of my one of the most inspiring thing that happened to me before I uh, before I worked in Slovenia was precisely encountering people from Zagreb and and Croatia and for instance the Klapcha network and the way they approached um, in a very uh, egalitarian fashion redistributing certain funds and so on and so on and the way they established rules to do so and how that evolved. Uh, further on than to actually es um, establishing the, the zaklada, I forgot the, the English term for it right now, uh, for culture that kind of- Cultura Nova. Cultura yeah, Nova. The foundation, yeah. yeah. So I, I like this, um, I think, and also Levan said, I think that we, we the, the fact is that we need alliances among ourselves and understanding of what are the terms of our oppression, but that we also need to have a very clear idea that we can reclaim the state, right? Because the state currently is really in the service of, you know, marketizing everything, the logic of competition rules everything, even if it's claimed that it's still public culture and so on and so on. And I think that, this awareness of cultural workers and of people who work in the culture about the economic aspects of their practice and the way um, laws and rules regulate these practices is very important, right? That um, I think that autonomy can't come from the fact that we are going to be beyond this, but that we are actually going to have our own uh, idea about what does the redistribution mean? What kind of policies do we want? What really matters? Because if we don't have these kinds of understanding of our own welfare, and if we don't have this interclass solidarity, and the ones that also Katarina talked about, right? How is my life similar, and how are certain things equally important for everyone uh, in in society? Is something that I think cultural workers also need to be aware of, because otherwise they can't politically struggle. Uh, for for their autonomy and that autonomy cannot go without uh, economy autonomy and economy should not be separated they have to be thought uh, of as two things that go together i think can i argue a little bit with this because uh, i i completely agree that we have to reclaim the state but um in very very practical terms i think we have to reclaim the states in order to, I think, in order to a little bit diversify uh, the way our services work and, and move certain things out, not into the private sphere, of course, but into that kind of common sphere. Because, because simply the state, especially with the four years you know, representative you know, election model, it's not gonna be ever close to to the needs, and it it's you know with all these good and bad things, it's a very it's a bureaucratic machine with which is able to protect public resources through the bureaucracy, but it's also able to completely you know uh, be completely insensitive to to changing needs and and and, and to needs on the ground. So I I think and I would like to think that there is a way. To, to diversify this in, in, in a sense that, uh, and again, this is very dangerous what I'm saying, of course, because there's a very thin line between, between the whole, I don't know, David Cameron idea of big society that takes over the tasks that the, the state should do. But uh, especially after one decade of, of, of Orban in Hungary, and I don't know how many years of uh, peace in Poland, uh, reclaiming the state is going to take two decades and 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 or more and and also we can reclaim the state and then lose it again in three years and and it's just simply 
you know, I agree, but it's just I don't see the practical path towards that. That it would actually recreate a lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, a lot of infrastructure and a lot of things that we need uh, immediately. But I totally agree, and this is where we should claim. In but what I see, for example, in in places where the state was reclaimed successfully, at least on the city level, I see that this is a feasible, feasible uh, strategy to. Even if you're on power, you you actually give up some of your power in order to to a little bit make the whole governance of public resources and services more horizontal. If you look at Barcelona again, I mean, of course, we all, we always speak about Barcelona, but you know, giving a lot of uh, let's say maybe not autonomy, but a lot of uh, legitimacy to spaces that would uh, run with very little public overse overview or overseeing while they were they are public in a way publicly supported the publicly created uh, organizations i think it's 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 uh, it's it's a very powerful thing and i think we have to reclaim the state in order to uh, i'm not saying uh, <laughs> to uh, reduce the state but to a little bit diversify what the state is and 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 take it away from you know, ten people who act as a government, uh, and even a parliament that is, you know, it has very serious limitations in in representing what people need. And I'm not an anarchist to say that we have to destroy the state, but I, I'm saying that there's a lot of governance uh, mechanisms that I guess can create a much fairer and much, you know, better functioning uh, society and 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 use of public resources. I totally agree with you, actually. <laughs> I just was trying to, I think that I agree with you with what you're saying. And I think it's important that when I think about reclaiming the state, I also don't think as it exists, right? I think that um, what I wanted to point out is that what I have perceived, especially in this post-socialist context is that state is sometimes now perceived also as us against them. I think that um, this kind of positioning of yourself is not good because you, you are the state. I mean, I know that this is very idealistic and crazy, but uh, like you say, I mean, we, we can reclaim and we can redefine, but we can do that, which is for instance, the, the lesson of, 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 of the situation in Zagreb and in Croatia is because first these um, uh, connections and relationships were built among the people, smaller groups from smaller grows bigger, right? And I think that that's, that's what you're talking about, Levant, also, right? Is that people create certain practices that then, you know, but power is important because unfortunately the power today still lies in this goddamn state, right? And I don't like it, like you say, that it is very uh, privatized and so on. And that's why I think that we need to have, uh, we, we need to think about it that way. That we cannot think about it in isolation because that's not the reality we're in. But so I agree very much with what you said. Mm, thank you for your all your uh, replies on on state. I didn't expect that it will be the most heated debate of uh, all the question. And yeah, you are right that we were touching a really lot of issues. Martin just wrote me during the discussion on chat that actually these are topics for a workshop and not only for a, a short webinar. Uh, there are already questions uh, uh, on the chat, so. Let's turn towards them. And if you have any other question, please write it into the chat box or raise your hand and then you can ask it directly. So the first question is from Esther Kalai, and it is about uh, the possible pitfalls of creating cultural commons, if I'm, I'm right. It says that even if it's possible to create a solidarity community within the art field, uh, the stake, stakes of the projects are often stay within the art world and they all, they often do not answer the real needs of communities on a long term. So uh, yeah, so I think it's a really relevant question that how to avoid that common in culture comes only culture and doesn't contribute to the common of our, our societies. Uh, I would like to well, not really answer this question, but it's I agree it's totally relevant. But um, in the chat. Uh, 
you muted that yourself. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I will allow myself in the chat to uh, put a link to the to the website uh, called Culture for Solidarity. It is a, a website of the investigation, a project, uh, a couple of organizations, including Critica Politica, but our friends uh, from Zagreb as well. We were doing for for three uh, three or four years. Uh, um, so there is a lot of material um, regarding the question of culture and solidarity and also experimentations how to um, uh, transform uh, cultural practices from community oriented towards uh, solidarity oriented uh, practices. So it's a big question um, I would not uh, like to even try to answer uh, now but maybe if you are more interested in uh, the perspective on uh, some of the perspectives on culture and uh, solidarity i i kindly ask you to visit this website thank you i, I would come back to igor's because i think there's a link between what you said igor and, and the question by uh, by Esther is is the whole thing that as you as you mentioned and I really like this definition that community stays inside and solidarity op opens it up and I think it's a very s simple way to put it and and I guess that's uh, as I'm no longer really active in in, in in the culture field so I see it in the outside from the outside a little bit and 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 I think that's definitely one of the big issues as, as Esther describes it in in the chat the, that uh, it's very very introverted in the sense that uh, that uh, uh, a big part of artistic production seeks its audience in the very similar people and even if it seeks its audience outside it's because of it uh, it wants to you know add up to expectations still with within the same uh, same 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 uh, closed universe and I, I i really like when when we stop talking about culture as a, maybe as a field of 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 creation and, and we open it up a little bit as a, as something that uh, in a way on the one hand of course connects us but also teaches us how we can think how can we think outside of the 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 the, 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 the norm, norms the daily norms how can we you know think wild how can we go beyond things how can we look at things from a different perspective and i guess projects like i mean that's why i really like european culture foundation you you, you work with here that uh, it's sometimes it's about sometimes some, something that we define as culture sometimes it's about much more and i think culture is much more and i guess this is probably a little bit the key to um to, uh, I'm, I'm speaking now in a very laic way uh, outside of the culture and of course the culture field talks about this all the time but but of course there's, there's, a, there's a big 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 problem with, with communication there's a big problem with the uh, middle class that is very sophisticated and people who don't care uh, so I guess simply from from community we have to work towards solidarity which uh, aims at you know talking simply to much more people or different kinds of people and i would also add that yeah that with these kinds of thinking in the culture right is again like uh, it reminds me a little bit of academia right is the culture sphere this sphere is now gonna do this kind of um, community and commoning projects and it takes itself out while at the same time, these cultural workers who are doing these commoning projects are precarious, unpaid, this and that, right? So it's like as if you can, like you can alienate yourself from the from the rest of of, of the community or work, whomever you're working with, who, that may be more disenfranchised than you are, right? So I think that there's a danger. What you're saying, also Levant, right, is about how we think about art and culture. That art and culture has become this professionalized field, uh, which can develop certain projects. But I think it's on us to start understanding them and embedding them in, in, in more on a processual way, right? It's not a project, I'm gonna go there and we're gonna create commons. No, you need to build relationships. I mean, if you don't build a connections with, with, with the surrounding, it's, it's gonna be, 
it's not a project, it's commoning is a process, right? And so I think that part of it is also, for me at least, I'm very interested in the self-critique of the cultural field, of what you said also, Levant, about this idea of autonomy, of very individualistic people who are doing art for very particular reasons, and you know that can get attached to various political projects, but they are not, uh, it's not, they're not really interested in them, right? It's popular, it becomes part of these, uh, game of you know promotion of some certain things but not real social change and I think that that's always a danger of culture becoming you know I mean old a long time ago Marcuse said affirmative character of culture and you know that's that's a big danger I think when we talk about culture in uh, and we need to think about that yeah that we need to also really find and and uh, have a different understanding of what is the role of these kinds of practices in society. I would just like to add one thing, if I can, it's going to take a minute, uh, kind of for a wrap up. I think the, in the beginning we said that, you know, fetishization of any form will not bring us further in towards where we want to be, where we envision uh, some kind of emancipation that will come as a result of commoning. So I also think when this, you know, completely uh, horizontal logics of commons and the, you know, this other logic of institutional change that we've mentioned a, a bit earlier could somehow get, you know, hybridized into something that has uh, a bit more of a polymorphic structure that can be very horizontal, but then when the tactical situation approaches to grasp, grasp something, then it can get into like a more of a formation. And it's a kind of a that polym polymorphic thing that you have a movement kind of idea, but also institutional kind of, you know, um, the type of uh, structures that help it gain ground. Because what is the power of institution is the is the um, ability to re reproduce uh, its values, you know, continuously. And the movements often, you know, just fizzle out or become, as you Levanta said, kind of become these empty vessels. So I'm, I'm thinking what could be productive in, in, in terms of, you know, how to bring things further is this like polymorphic structures that can be, you know, like a shapeshifters and can answer the situation, not from the, oh, I'm this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm commons or I'm culture, but I'm many things. I'm, you know, I am actually, you know, this multitude, I'm many things at once. And this is maybe the way how to think about, you know, reclaiming and this emancipatory potentials. Thank Thanks. you very much for your comments. There, there were two really exciting comments in the chat box. I will actually delegate one of them on community art for cheap labor from Christian to the second panel because I think it relates very well there but there is one which is directly connected to our state uh, state debate or state discussion from Neboisha uh, who wrote that actually and I think he's right that these semi peripheral states do not owe them on owe themselves so they the semi peripheral states of Eastern Europe are uh, embedded into an even uh, an even international dependencies so how, and it, I think it's a relevant question to ask that, how does it uh, touches our play to reclaim the state or re get back to the state? So yeah, how to reclaim the state that is not only a sovereign nation state, but it's embedded in, into uneven international dependencies. Wow, it's fascinating, the levels of agency and the levels of uh, dependency. I think we were speaking about the, uh, the local authorities. We spoke a little bit about regional and the state authorities before we go to the global government. Uh, it will take a little bit of time. No, but seriously speaking, it's a, I agree that it's an extremely um, interesting remark and thank you for this. I have no answer, but uh, yeah, what came to my mind uh, was indeed the, the question of the levels of agency and the, the, the dimensions of dependency. So thank you for this uh, remark. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I think that it's also again a question of scales, right? I mean, I think that it is, 
I mean, this is my experience that one thing is to organize even your immediate community and to generate certain kind of solidarity. And it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work to work in collectives, to figure out how you want to define certain things. I mean, it's hard work. And so when we try to think about the nations and the states and international movements, but I think that there are, that we do have commonalities. It's just a question of, of I think it's it's a it's a problem because what I'm noticing and I think because of the pandemic and now that we are all in these kind of zoom situations right it is not so easy to get us here for three hours to talk about but then we will all return to our own individual places where we are right and so um, I think the disconnection between uh, inter the, the international scope and our individual little locations is so important and I mean, I wish I knew how to connect it, but I think it's really a question of scales. And then perhaps the, the idea that we do know that there are communities which think the same way and so that we are connected. Because you remember when we were earlier, we talked about that it's important, the self-care and the awareness that we are not alone. So, um, I mean, I know that this is not very hippie kind of thinking <laughs> to the question that never wish I had, but it's like, I don't know, I mean, it, the, the socialist revolution uh, in the in the first half of the 20th century started in little cells where people got organized and eventually it turned into a, a larger movement and some of those movements actually reclaimed the states and redefined it with all its problems I know I'm not saying it was ideal but you know I mean we need to act we need to think politically in the culture and beyond it so yeah, I don't know. There's, but it's a problem. I mean, the the how the Buddha has this great essay on compradorial bourgeoisie, and I think there's a lot. Of, I mean, there's there's a lot of great texts about um, in what ways these little nation states, especially in the post Yugoslav context, are not really um, are in the control of European Union and so on. So it's it's a huge problem, I think. But we can't give up. Thank you for this comment. Maybe I will use it as a conclusion. And thank you for being here today. I think for me, at least, it was a, one of the most exciting uh, discussions of the last weeks or months. Uh, so now we have a 20 minutes long cafe break, or maybe tea break, or beer break because it's pretty late. And uh, we will continue the discussions uh, with the uh, moderation of Marcos Sarvas from 6 p.m. Central European time. So we have uh, 20 minutes of, of break. So you could follow the second session also here in the same Zoom link or, and also in the Facebook live stream. So dear Lavanta, uh, Katja, Katarina, and Igor, thank you for being here and contributing. I really enjoyed it. I hope that everyone enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um... You know, we don't stop the Zoom because it's basically continuing here. I think the Buddhan one, Kaicha. Ah, the Buddhan one. Okay, yeah. Okay, I'll send it because there was somebody was asking me for the article. I was like, which article do they want? Okay, I'll I'll find it and I'll post. Is the chat gonna be on? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hi, Annette. Nice to see you. Hey, Levanta. It's been a while. Yes. How are you? Good. Well, good. And you? Still in Rome? No, in Budapest. Budapest. Yeah. You in Rotterdam? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm in The Hague now, actually. But More or less, yeah. More or less Rotterdam. Okay. In one city. <laughs> okay. I'll be here listening to you as well, but I think I'll go on the Facebook. Ooh. Because I think it's Facebook Live and also in the Zoom, right, Christoph? Yes, both mm. together in parallel. Miracles of technology. Yeah. 
Okay. And how are things in uh, Afrikaner like? Well, it's pretty hectic. Yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> we just uh, started. Uh, I don't know if it was over. We were already working on it when uh, when I last spoke to you, but we did this challenge uh, on the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Over the clean waste collection. And uh, yeah, we've been in conflict with the municipality for two years. <laughs> we just restarted yesterday and it was like total chaos. So, <laughs> okay. And um, yeah, it's, it's very hectic. And yeah, amongst all the other things that are <laughs> happening, of course, we have a lot of. A lot of employees with corona so okay mm -hmm. and but i guess because south rotterdam probably is more affected now as i imagine or no yeah well it, that was but um now currently it's like everywhere it's also in the small villages okay i'm actually quite happy because there, like a couple of months ago there was this tendency to to look to to neighborhoods like the afrikaner i guess like the, all going wrong down there but now it's it's just the, just very unpredictable so it happens everywhere yeah so they cannot blame no the the neighborhoods no but, uh, yeah yeah it, it's happy because uh, yeah, people who you work with you cannot really um, connect them on zoom or you i mean you need to see them yeah it's hard, it's hard to organize because there's a lot of fear. Hmm, but did, did you try to like build up digitally some of these connections or, or is it just a little impossible? bit? Yeah, we yeah. did it. Yeah, or we're doing it, but it's not. Hmm. Um, and also a lot of the work that we do is just, yeah, you have to be there. Um, yeah. Not only for me, but also like the people that work for the co-op. Yeah. It's all physical labor. And how about you? Well, I moved back a year ago and to Budapest from Rome. And then since then, it's it's been pretty local. <laughs> it's for everyone. So yeah. still we have uh, Daniela and the others at Rome. Some others are in Vienna. So we're a little bit working uh, from distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, it's interesting because now in, 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 in Budapest, it's, there's a new municipality with a lot of ambitions, a lot of participation, but very big pressure from the government. So we're trying to help out a bit, but it's not easy because, because there's so much pressure. But I guess it's a, it's a moment which can open up a lot of new things mm -hmm. and can also ruin a lot of things. So we'll mm -hmm. see how we get out of this. Because this... Um... Is Budapest, um, like politically, is it very different from the rest of Hungary? Well, it's different from the government. Mm -hmm. Like it's the opposition, all mm -hmm. the opposition together against the government. And then the, the country, I mean, the biggest cities are usually in opposition and, and the smaller places are all on, on the right. Yeah. So Budapest is, is relatively a good place to be now. Yeah, but it's it's really, it's struggling very much with uh, a lot of pressure from the government, a lot of money is taken away. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not very easy. No, no. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just took him, but we're in sort of a break now and then... We are in the break, yeah. Uh, I, we will create soon a breakout room for the next participants and then we can test yeah. the technology. Already all of you is here. I can already put you in a breakout room. Is everyone here for the second session? No. Raluca is here and uh, Mark and Anna is not. So oh. we have one more missing. Yeah. Okay. So I will, I will let you Organize the second half, <laughs> and I'll follow on Facebook. So uh, oh. I'll survive. Thank you for coming and participating. Yeah. See you all. Ciao. Ciao.
I also wanted to say that I'll try to tune in afterwards, but I have to teach a little bit later. So <laughs> <laughs> we have the different time zones. You guys are already done with your day. <laughs> yeah. But it was nice to meet you. And thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah, it was really nice to meet you finally in person after reading your stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, bye-bye. Ciao. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi, Anna. Hi, Anna. Yeah. So maybe now I would like I will try to put all of you who are the speaker of the second panel put in a breakout room to let you okay. discuss the practicalities without an audience. I <laughs> hope that I mastered the Zoom enough to do it. <laughs> doing it give me a second never so easy mm -hmm. okay if everything is all right, you got an invitation for a breakout room.
So you would like me to start? Is that? Yeah, in the first uh, round, yes. Then the second round is the. Should I start the intro? So welcome everyone on the second part of the Common in Art and Culture webinar. Uh, in this part, we will be speaking about common in practices and institutional solutions uh, for um, the different crises which hits the culture workers. So this event is organized by the Solidarity Economy Center, which we established some years ago uh, to facilitate the making of uh, sorry. Uh, to facilitate the making of different initiatives in the field of economic democracy and cooperativism. And while in many um, fields there is like some kind of uh, progress, like housing, agriculture, care, and energy, in the in the field of culture it's uh, lacking, or there is a uh, no systematic uh, movement making, uh, which is obviously from on the one hand uh, uh, problematic as the as the people who are uh, working in the creative industries are hit by massive downward mobility and also by the authoritative turn in different uh, fields especially in the field of culture and uh, this ownership and utilization of culture in anti-systemic movement uh, can be a viable uh, solution for them uh, and we want to use this opportunity of the webinar to think together with people who are engaged with the idea of solidarity, economic cooperativism, commons, and uh, equal access to culture in a structured way to tackle uh, the issues like uh, the crisis of housing, the crisis of uh, social reproduction, unequal access to cultural institutions, and uh, inquire how like institutions which are based on the principles of economic democracy can be uh, solving these problems. Obviously, it's quite big, but uh, as in the case of the previous panel, we can <laughs> reach a certain, uh, I don't know, conclusion and then continue these discussions in, in, the, in the future. And uh, so this part, which focuses mainly on practices of commoning and institutional uh, structures, which can be built up, will be uh, structured in the following way. So there will be a, uh, this introduction of each panelist, and then I will have like four questions. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we open the discussion for the for the for the audience and uh, our panelists are Anna Jokic and Mark Milan from the Stadt in the Mark from Rotterdam, Annette from Otello from the African Devay Cooperative, also from Rotterdam, Raul Kavoyne from the Transit Bucharest, Lucia Udvardova from the East Indies and Shape, and uh, the Plan Nora and Talek. Uh, Koka Zofia uh, from uh, Mütte. And uh, so, Raluca, can you start the introduction? We're mainly interested in how, like, uh, your initiative transit in this case was built up and what were the main projects in terms of its history and how, like, uh, it participates in, in, uh, in socially sensitive or socially impactful artistic or culture production. Also in terms of what it means in your case comments. Thank you, Martin, for the invitation and for the questions, uh, which are uh, big and important, especially now during this time when uh, cultural organizations had to go through a rethink, uh, a structural one. Um, 
And um, I will start with the end, let's say, of this uh, part of the story. Um, uh, because for us in, in Bucharest, Transit Bucharest, the beginning of the pandemic coincided with the uh, uh, with the desire and the necessity to rethink structurally. So we these were over overlapping. Uh, basically, uh, two months before the pandemic started, uh, we closed our space in Bucharest, which was active for seven years. Um, and I will I will uh, maybe uh, share the screen if I can, just to have some uh, images that are accompanying what I'm going to tell you. Uh, okay, um, let's see. Um, I'm not sure what you are actually <laughs> able to see from this, but I will just uh, let them um, uh, be on the screen as a, as a slideshow. So um, as you, probably all of you know, Transit um, is a network of institutions in Central and Eastern Europe, which was started almost 20 years ago in in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia uh, under the, um, let's say, uh, patronage and with the su financial support of Erste Foundation from Vienna. And um, uh, each of these, uh, each of the transit um, uh, institutions is autonomous, established in their own countries, including Hungary. And uh, the Romanian transit was invited to, to be part of this network uh, late, let's say, it, or, towards 2010, and it was a a long process until we uh, were officially founded in 2012. And unlike the other uh, transits, uh, which were present in the capitals of, of their countries, um, we uh, came with a proposal from many different reasons uh, to establish ourselves as a network within the bigger network. So uh, Transit Romania started as a, uh, an institution in three cities, uh, Bucharest, Cluj and Yash. So we, at that time, we had this logic on the one hand, uh, when we were invited to propose the institution, we were uh, um, all coming from the um, independent um, and quite precarious cultural scene of the, of the country. We knew each other and um, uh, we decided that rather than each one of us proposing their idea of what transit could be in Romania, to join forces and uh, divide the, the fund amongst ourselves. So each one of us had access to actually less lesser amount, but instead uh, offering a, a, a platform that was built on uh, uh, collaboration and non-competition and uh, sharing of the resources. So this was our, let's say, main uh, fund, founding principles. <laughs> and um, uh, while at that time they were uh, not immediately understood, um, gradually this came to be a, a very used practice. Um, the idea that uh, uh, in culture as well, even though it's uh, in, in contemporary art as well, which is our main field, um, um, you have to counter the uh, um, individualism and to, to collaborate and uh, to, to try to have a common voice. And um, uh, I will speak mostly for the experience of Bucharest, which I was uh, uh, responsible for. Um, and in, in Bucharest, we uh, opened this space that you can see in the picture uh, in 2012. And uh, since then, it, it has grown organically to be uh, a lot of things uh, of which uh, contemporary art was just a small part. So uh, we responded a lot to the context a uh, context in which there are very few art spaces, very few places for people to gather, for platforms to, independent platforms to, to uh, um, perform or to express, and also for uh, a space for interaction with different fields from the, yeah, uh, I don't know, um, socially engaged uh, uh, practices uh, with uh, uh, people from the academia and from, from different forms of activism. So um, slowly, um, whatever uh, program we had uh, as a curatorial uh, proposal um, became only half of the of the program of the space, and the other half was uh, offered as a uh, as a um, hospitality, let's say, uh, platform. So we uh, opened the door to many different people and. Uh, the images that you are seeing are mostly from uh, one of the projects that became our core, let's say, um, 
that gave the the core identity of the of the space which was its garden so because this was something that we started to use uh, slowly and um, we um, started from a, a permaculture um, let's say small program and which uh, then became a small community and then this community in turn generated other forms of interest for us as a as a space in the city and um, and then the the garden sort of took over and uh, we started to understand differently our uh, connection to what we were doing so um, and uh, also to see the interconnections and that uh, uh, art was not the most important thing so to say <laughs> while uh, it, it needed to be always connected to, to some urgencies and to some uh, life issues so, so to say so um, in the end this uh, this uh, space closed after seven years. We decided to leave it. Basically, it didn't close. We decided to leave it because uh, of uh, gentrification of the area. Uh, we also discussed many times on how, uh, if and how we contributed to this to this gentrification. It's a long story, but um, uh, it's a story that also goes in parallel with uh, with what happened uh, in general with the art spaces in. Uh, um, in Romania and how they are um, not only art, but let's say cultural spaces um, and how they are um, uh, submitted to the real estate market, which is very violent and very, uh, of course, not uh, affecting not only culture, but uh, most aspects of life. And uh, uh, through this, let's say, common struggle, we came to to, un to leave aside, you know, personal interests and uh, um, agendas and to, to come to, to dialogue with the uh, other of our colleagues, uh, sort of a dialogue which I don't think would have been possible 15 years ago, let's say. So, um, yeah, it was uh, basically the experience of, uh, of being part of this space uh, was also um, uh, a lesson in uh, how to approach uh, uh, this idea of, of commoning. So it's not something that uh, I, I personally have learned from the books. <laughs> so I, I have this, you know, I'm this generation of the, uh, who studied in the 90s when the anti-communist uh, discourse was very present. Um, and then I also studied in London, you know, in the, in the middle of the, of the uh, um, um, empire, let's say. So <laughs> I had all this background where um, learning about the commons was, uh, uh, was not self-evident, so to say. So uh, for me, it came with this experience of working with transit and positioning the space of transit in the middle of all these uh, uh, sometimes even dramatic changes in the um, political landscape in, uh, and economic landscape in, in the city and in the country. So I, I have many things to say, but <laughs> I don't want to monopolize. <laughs> Lucia, can you continue? Just... Yeah? I can um, hear you. Yeah, 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 it's the classic mute, unmute, um, Zoom. Uh, my name is Lucia Udvadiova and I've uh, been involved in various um, music, uh, culture-related projects. Uh, since uh, the last 10 plus years, uh, mostly based on various networks and platforms which are um, grassroots, which are independent and which some of them are funded, some are non-funded. So, so it's various structures uh, which I've been able to uh, witness and experience. And um, one of them, let's say, that I'm involved in is Eastern Days, which is a project that um, aims to sort of explore the underground music cultures and subcultures in Eastern Europe. And um, uh, we started this project more than 10 years ago and, and, and it has grown into a sort of a network of these contacts and musicians uh, all across the region of Central Eastern Europe. Uh, we also do an event in Berlin uh, where we invite, let's say, collectives and labels from Berlin to work together with collectives and labels from Central Eastern Europe. And they develop 
a project uh, that is presented and this year we are doing it sort of basically not off, not not in physical space we usually do it in berlin but this year uh, because of the pandemic we were forced to sort of rethink how you sort of move this um, communities which are sort of uh, very present in the in the sort of local and physical sphere uh, to to sort of spheres that are not online streaming or not only online but that can be presented in other ways so we do like a split cassette and fanzine we do an <clears throat> installation video installation and yeah and various other stuff but yeah and then uh, I'm also involved in a platform which is uh, called Shape, which is a network of 16 uh, music and audiovisual, audiovisual festivals from Europe who came together and they created this um, project or platform for emerging musicians and audiovisual artists. And this project is the Shape platform is supported by the Creative Europe program of the European Union and uh, then uh, then I'm also like one of my fun projects is um, um, serious called Noise and Roses which is a sort of um, ad hoc um, off space flat slash flat event series that I do with a friend of mine uh, in Budapest and that that sort of is always a very communal um, happening, which is very nice actually to experience because we, we always do it, we, we've done it in somebody's flat. So, so there were people who, friends of ours who offered their, their, their flat basically to, to, to organize a concert and then and, and, and everybody helps. Like it's totally non-money based thing. So people bring, somebody brings the sound, somebody. So yeah, like people are collaborating and helping and, and and there's totally no money involved no support no funding so so yes this is a sort of brief overview of the project and and i'm also i forgot uh fest which is an important festival which is an interesting festival in budapest that also is a uh, um helping to sort of um connect these underground scenes in Budapest. Thank you. And Anna and Mark, can you continue? Yes, sure. We will also share the screen. Oh, just to find it. Just a sec. Okay, we have a small presentation, so we will just run through it in these five minutes. We have a number of paths from which we could speak, but today we speak from uh, the city in, in the making, cats, <laughs> city in the making in Rotterdam. Yes, so city in the making is a relatively small organization that over the last few years maybe somewhat to our own surprise, became a, a redeveloper or a reviver of stalled, unused uh, buildings in Rotterdam, especially in the north of Rotterdam. Um, and that had its starts in our encounter with empty, unused spaces in the city, buildings that were stuck somehow, that were uh, too bad to be, uh, to be used. Uh, but also too expensive to be fixed for their owners. So they became a sort of uh, toxic assets. And when we encountered that, we were thinking like, can we somehow get them going again? And when I say we, um, that were four of us, we had uh, all a background in, in culture and spatial practices. But this what we wanted to do with these buildings, not per se was something which was coming out of a sort of cultural drive, but that's something very basic, something about access to space in the, in the city. Uh, we started with these two buildings, which you see in the center of this image in 2014, and they looked much worse at the start of the project than on this image. But the basic principle 
from the very beginning was that the two thirds of the space are collective living spaces, which are upper floors and the ground floors are common or spaces of reproduction. And the, the idea, starting idea was to provide affordable spaces for living, uh, meeting and working and experiment with unconventional programs and methods. And this, this location is really uh, very close to the central station of Rotterdam, so quite central. And this gentrification wave was already starting at that point. Uh, and it was an important uh, statement, let's say, that this also uh, spaces can be claimed by people that don't have much money and can afford this. The main target group of this project uh, are what we call misfits. So people who are overlooked uh, in the government are alloc allocation lists for affordable or social housing and also artists who are uh, pretty mobile and have a very different lifestyle. So the project started through self-built living spaces and mostly reused materials. Um, this is just a sample of some of the spaces that have been uh, done in the course of the project, mainly by people who live in them themselves. And these ground floor commons uh, uh, and spaces that are used for various purposes. Uh, we can talk about that later. Some are cultural, some are uh, reproductive spaces. Uh, which are basically all used for free by the community. And currently uh, the, the city in the making has 62 housing units and, and also common spaces. And you can't see on the image, but about hundred people are living or, or working in these spaces. And of these uh, 62 housing units, uh, actually a majority or uh, we we started with the minority in a few buildings and then uh two years ago suddenly we got access to um, a part of a street so 52 uh, apartments uh, part of a street which was to be demolished and for us that was um that was a sort of like a switch moment where we suddenly could think much uh, much bigger or more intense than what we had done in the in the time before but also this was uh, this was really like uh, something for a period of one and a half to two years so there was also quite a hurry to uh, to get things going in this um, here you see this is this is uh, the streets called Almonde Street in Rotterdam not very important the name but basically what we wanted to do there were uh, or what we wanted to get active there were four things uh, to have housing for people, uh, especially housing for those who have difficulties finding other housing in the city, um, to have also a boarding house or so something for, uh, for very short uh, duration from a few days to a few weeks maximum. Then we wanted to have uh, to give space uh, for uh, or have space for local initiatives and space for commons. So this was something for a period of 18 months and that also meant that uh, in contradiction to the space which we saw before, which much more gradually have been growing into their role, uh, this was uh, much more programmed from the start. So here you have a few, you have a few, uh, a few uh, uh, images of what it looks basically inside. So these are some of the housing spaces. This all looks neat. There's also, for instance, there's housing for uh, youngsters who would otherwise uh, end up on the street. That looks a bit different than this here, but. Um, this is the boarding house, a few images of that. Um, then we went around in the neighborhood to look actually for groups, communities, initiatives which uh, were in need of space but could not afford it any longer in the neighborhood. And we tried to welcome them as much as possible. And there were various forms of, uh, of commons. Uh, some of these commons are very basic commons like a collective laundry. Uh, others are uh, like a radio station, uh, a central uh, meeting room, uh, but also during the, the pandemic, they became a, a sort of like a local care station has uh, evolved there. Uh, this street is something which, uh, which for us was very, uh, a very short uh, venture. We are now at the moment, we are uh, at the point where we are uh, struggling with the owner around uh, the, the upcoming uh, eviction. Uh, part of that we made uh, also an explicitly cultural event, and that's uh, an opera, a street opera. 
the demolishment opera, which speaks about, uh, you know, like about the groups which have difficulty to find their space in the city, which are continuously pushed around. Um, and here you have an image of it. As you saw that uh, a lot of this is around uh, basically hacking uh, temporary uh, kind of uh, use of these spaces. Uh, it's not something which you per se are looking for. We are trying to look uh, for permanent space, but that's something which is, uh, which is rather difficult, especially with the real estate prices still going up in the, in the city and in the neighborhood in which we are. Um, so you're trying to get to that or, well, there's an alternative mentioned also in the bottom. Yeah, I can now stop sharing somehow. Yeah. Mm. How do we do that? Yeah. Oops. Did we stop sharing or I don't know? No. We just, uh, we just see another. We have a bit of difficulty to get back to the screen. Maybe you have to kick us out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, there we are. <laughs> so, thank you, uh, Annette. Can you continue the, the introduction? Also, had the classic. Um, so, I'm uh, Annette from Otolo. Uh, from the uh, neighborhood cooperative uh, in the Afrikaanerwijk, also in, in Rotterdam. Um, and we are on the south part uh, of the city, so the other side of uh, uh, Anaheim Mark. And I will also try to share my screen to show you some images. Um, you seeing my screen now? Um, yeah, so the, uh, the area that we work in um, and uh, where our cooperative is based is the uh, Afrikaander uh, Wijk. Um, like I said, on the south part of the, uh, the River de Maas. And uh, this is an area, um, yeah, typical neighborhood um, uh, with uh, a lot of social housing, um, a lot of people from migratory background and a high unemployment rate, but at the same time, a lot of culture and creativity and craftsmanship. Um, and it, it is enclosed by uh, a couple of neighborhoods that are were going, uh, uh, um, yeah, like the area Katenrecht was really gentrifying uh, or is gentrified right now. The, uh, the other areas were a lot of, um, there was a lot of uh, urban renewal projects happening. And uh, what we wanted to do 10 years ago when we started working in this area was focus on the uh, on the things that you see on the right side, like the, the culture, the creativity and the craftsmanship instead of focusing on all the uh, data. Um, and when I say we, um, it was back then uh, in 2009, um, uh, I was working together with a, a visual artist, uh, Jeanne van Heeswijk, who was the initiator. Um, and uh, yeah, you wanted to, to hear something about the history. So I think I'm gonna tell you the whole story. Uh, so it started as a cultural, uh, uh, as an art project with art funding, uh, but it grew out to be um, uh, a cooperative um, uh, employing 45 people in the neighborhood uh, and focusing mainly on uh, economical uh, flows and how to keep them in, in the neighborhood. Um, here you see some pictures of our first project that we did was on the market uh, and it was about imagining another sort of uh, day market. Um, we made a lot of connections to uh, between uh, uh, artists and designers and market vendors um, about different ways to present their products, uh, um, but also thinking about this central place in the area in a different way. Uh, looking, um, for instance, to the classical Agora, um, um, where it was, um, the market was also the place where you could meet the other and where um, uh, not only goods would exchange, but would be exchanged, but also um, um, the news would be spread and, and uh, an important place for encounter. And um, this is, of course, still the um, 
still an important function of this market. Um, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. Um, after this project on the market, we initiated uh, uh, a few cooperative workspaces, um, which were very much about also this commoning and working together. Um, we tried to focus on uh, informal ways of um, in which people were producing, and um, we were trying to connect them to uh, to the economical flows in the area to to um, to set up small local businesses um, as a as a cultural organization. Uh, in that time, uh, we set up cultural businesses uh, that would really employ um, people. And this is the uh, a catering business, which is still running today. Uh, we have a, 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 um, a fashion studio. Um, here you see uh, um, something that we made for the Jean Paul Gaultier. Uh, so we're, uh, we have uh, a lot of different clients. Um, now we have um, a bigger, like in, in 2013, we decided to change from um, from being this art project into uh, uh, the cooperative that we are now, um, because we had a very good uh, experiences with the uh, a cooperative way of working, um, uh, we we decided to formalize that into a cooperative structure. Um, um, at this point, we have um, uh, even extended this structure over the whole um, uh, over two different neighborhoods in, uh, in the south part of Rotterdam. And we've uh, set up a, a central co-op which employs um, people. Um, and we, uh, uh, yeah, we've set up a, a lot of different small businesses. Um, unfortunately, this is in Dutch, but um, it goes from catering to cleaning, to fashion, to uh, transportation. Um, uh, but we also still have a cultural program, um, which is a very important backbone of our organization. Um, what we do is we try to look at all the, uh, the economical flows in the area and try to lock them into uh, the area. Um, and like I said, the cultural program is still a, an important part of our uh, uh, activities. Uh, we have a, a central space, which is uh, our common uh, so to say, um, um, and we operate from here. And um, yeah, I think for everyone, it's an it's a difficult year. But for us, uh, uh, what is very weird is that we had um, we've been into the um, uh, adapted to the uh, the um, the funding system of the uh, city of Rotterdam. So we have a structural funding for our art project program for four years now, for the first time ever. Um, so we have to think about our program and at the same time we cannot use our space as we used to um, because of course all the things that you see are not possible within the current situation. Um, so that's very uh, contradictionary. Um, at the moment I'm, I'm totally uh, exhausted from this uh, project that we just started or restarted yesterday which is uh, um, um, uh, the project in which we um, took over the waste collection and the cleaning of the market. Um, and uh, we used uh, the right to challenge for this. And this is an, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's enormous. <laughs> um, but we're, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a bit, <laughs> overworked at the moment but we have uh, uh, we started restarted yesterday um, and we uh, employed 11 new people to to organize this we took it over from the from the local authorities uh, and we organized the waste uh, collection in a sustainable way so we, we separate the waste uh, we um, uh, we facilitate reuse and recycling uh, and we uh, create local jobs. Um, we make new products uh, together with artists and designers out of the waste flows. Um, uh, we created a central station 
where we can uh, separate the waste and uh, facilitate the, the, the reuse. This is a temporary one, uh, which we opened yesterday, but the uh, final design is going to be this. Um, so you could say that this is a second uh, uh, a common that we're placing in the area, um, uh, in this heart of the, uh, of the market, um, where 15,000 visitors a day can encounter uh, the, uh, this, this space and also come into contact with, the, uh, uh, with new um, products, uh, sustainable products. Um, and this is my last image. This is an overview uh, view of how we try to work. Like we, we work in a lot of different fields and we try to connect uh, a lot of different uh, dots. We try to connect informal and formal networks uh, and, and by that trying to create a, a strong uh, tissue in the area. Thank you. Uh, and now from Rita. Uh, my name is Jofi and she's Nora. Uh, we are members of uh, Mütter uh, Artist Run Space. And uh, uh, this, uh, this space was started by, by artists studying at the University of Fine Arts uh, in uh, 2016. And uh, I joined the group uh, a little, little bit uh, later. Um, and uh, from the from the beginning, uh, uh, was important for us to to create a space uh, not only for ourselves but for for the whole uh, uh, scene for the for the young young artists and uh, and to to have this uh, this opportunity to 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 create and uh, to 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 do everything. Uh, not as usual, so, so to try out things uh, 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 freely, I guess. And, um, and uh, it was also mentioned uh, uh, that um, uh, we, we also needed to leave, leave our space that we, we created after two years. Uh, and uh, now we are sharing the space with another um, uh, art uh, art space which is uh, uh, which run by by uh, a curator and an artist and um, and now we, we we are looking for a new space in uh, in this uh, this area the eight district of Budapest um, and now uh, what uh, wanted to we can also share our uh, website to see. Um, uh, this is uh, this is our group. We are uh, now nine people uh, in in the in the in the art space or art collective. Um, uh, everyone is uh, from or the University of uh, Fine Arts of Budapest or the Modern Art University. So we we have an academic background. But um, yeah, we are we are open not only for for the academic art scene. Let's say we have a very strong uh, collaboration with the with the music scene. We know well uh, Lucia as well and the program that she mentioned before. Uh, we are like uh, visitors or organizers or co-organizers of this uh, this events sometimes, um, and uh, I don't know maybe. Uh, I can also mention here some some uh, other project that I'm involved in, which is uh, the Lamajun Radio, which is a, a community radio just started um, two years ago, and it's uh, it's also a nice uh, uh, experience to create uh, uh, and build community, because I guess uh, this is why we were uh, invited to this uh, this uh, chat and uh, talk because uh, we are like uh, uh, sharing uh, experiences and uh, trying out uh, new things uh, not only in, in the art scene but uh, but also in, in wider um, culture of scene i guess maybe alter room maybe yeah please. and uh, yeah also the the alter room that uh, we have this uh, funded uh, project 
um, uh, which is uh, uh, basically it's an um, uh, artist-run uh, network or, or the initiative to, to build an artist-run network uh, in this uh, Central European uh, scene. And uh, we are working together with, uh, with Vuno from Košice, uh, with Yuten uh, from, from, from Belgrade, and uh, with uh, uh, 35 square meter from uh, Prague. And uh, we are um, creating uh, events and uh, talks um, and, and the catalog to discover this, uh, this uh, similarities and uh, differences in the in this uh, community's artworks which is are similar but quite different with quite different backgrounds yeah sorry i'm super excited <laughs> as you can hear <laughs> yeah and nori if you want to join uh, or say something that i forgot yeah and uh, i think it's also very important that um, Basically, we are also non-funded uh, project space, which means that we started um, funding our space. Uh, it was a shared studio and uh, exhibition space in the beginning. Uh, so there was actually a room uh, that was no window on, and we started to use this space uh, to create a platform for projects that were not um, involved in the institutional uh, uh, culture scene. So, uh, yeah, you, as you can see on some of the pictures, this was our first space. So that's how we started our uh, exhibition space. And after like three years, we still don't have any fundings except for this other project that's uh, funded by the Visegrad Fund, but it's also a, a, a project funding. So, like. Um, yeah, to run this, uh, our new space is basically, um, yeah, we just put the money together and uh, like that's how we, our financial background is <laughs> going on actually. It's our, also our love project basically, but um, yeah, there is no uh, funding on it. I guess it's also important to say. And I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will turn the questions uh, backwards, which I sent you, because like uh, now it seems that it's kind of uh, you. We are all, all over the place with different projects, but when we we created this uh, this uh, lineup of of invited speakers, our idea was that how. Like there is this tendency of using cultural capital and stepping out from the field of cultural production as you as you uh, engage with social issues and build these different kinds of institutions on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, you you build up these networks to actually like in the case of East and this like to 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 struggle with already existing like uh, global structures as in the case of the music global music industry, which uh, uh, exoticizing Eastern European music, and then you create a network to, to, to tackle that actual uh, institutional system. So I'm, my first question would be that how you see the position of the artist and then the cultural producer as it kind of in this inter, in this position, which is in between the cultural production field of cultural production and and the actual like other institution building uh, uh, forms of institution building so like in the case of uh, Afri african and which becomes like a hub of of the neighborhood but originally uh was started as an uh, art project And uh, Raluca, can you start? You're the first one on my screen. Yeah, somehow I felt the question was was directed uh, to someone else. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, for for me, it was clear from the beginning, as I always worked with artists, 
<laughs> but uh, the, the question was not if uh, artists have a role or um, what kind of role they, they have um, in, in society and in, in questions that are really pressing in our societies, but uh, uh, also how to make society accept them and understand that they, they, this, that this role is important. So it was never a um, one-way uh, discussion. And uh, for this reason, um, I have also personally been involved in, in um, other initiatives and collectives that were discussing about artist rights um, and um, um, how to, to look at the work of artists as work. So including Art Leaks, uh, a platform established in the um, uh, 2010s. Um, and um, 2011, yeah. Well, anyway, there, there were these questions that were coming, uh, bouncing back to us uh, uh, through, throughout all these years. And uh, um, the struggle in, in Romania was uh, even more important because art was never seen as something essential, as something it was always perceived as uh, in this old romantic way as a, a, a decorative uh, part of our lives. And um, um, in, in the case of transit, uh, um, it, it was always clear that uh, we worked with, uh, with artists who were interested in, uh, um, um, in <laughs> perceiving the, the world around them in, in a wider sense. And it was never about uh, studio practices or very seldom it was about studio practices and uh, uh, this kind of, let's say, more commercial trends of, of contemporary art. Uh, while at the same time, um, you know, uh, we opened up the space for so many people coming with uh, so many, uh, uh, you know, pressing agendas with different backgrounds, and uh, um, somehow one one thing which we never managed to achieve was to to have the same kind of hospitality towards us from other uh, cultural institutions, let's say, or uh, not necessarily hospitality, but at least understanding. So uh, we continue to have this struggle in, in the public uh, media here in, in Romania uh, when it comes to what artists represent. And uh, I think they are you know, strongly connected. If we expect artists to, to give back something to society, we should also expect society to, to um, treasure them as, as important members. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an ongoing struggle. and. Uh, uh, I am I am committed to to the cause of artists, and at the same time, I, I also, um, especially at these times, you know, it it was very clear how they were uh, some of the, you know, speaking of misfits, like Annette was was saying, you know, artists um, are some of the most underprivileged of the misfits, let's say, uh, especially in in countries such as ours where there was never really a. Um, I mean, there was a structure, but it was lost, let's say, let's call it like that, a very centralized and controlled structure during the, the communist years or socialist years, the artist union. And uh, that structure was uh, con completely dismissed in the 90s uh, with its uh, good parts, which were the unionizing and the rights, the social rights that artists used to have because of that structure. But uh, overall, um, it, it was a complicated situation. The structure still exists. Uh, and some artists are gathering uh, the voices today to to try to salvage something of that structure in terms of not exactly unionizing, but trying to fight for their rights in a in a collective way. And right now there are uh, discussions with the Ministry of Culture and with the municipality to try to implement some uh, state support uh, schemes uh, during this uh, uh, pandemic and hopefully also after. So I don't know, there are many, many uh, lines of discussion, so. <laughs> Lucia? Um, I think it's interesting also in music, it, it works maybe a little bit differently than in arts, like music scenes, especially those ones maybe that I'm involved with are very grassroots, so they're not institutionalized, they are not funded so they, they are very self-organized and it's interesting that this um, connecting and, and this connection between 
Eastern European labels and Eastern European collectives within the region, I think has become more, um, has become stronger and has become more active than maybe it was 10, 15, 10 years ago when we sort of started this sort of research when a lot of the times where we traveled the, the awareness about let's say what's happening in the neighboring countries like you didn't really know what's happening in Poland when you were in Hungary or in Romania and now I, I feel that this this maybe thanks to social media this knowledge and awareness is is greater and and there are also these initiatives where when 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 these underground music labels and scenes and collectives get involved within let's say activist uh, public space um in poland there were there was there's this um, collective called oramex which is very active uh, supporting queer and lgbtq um causes in poland which we know political poli in terms of politics what's happening there so they are um helping the doom like benefit compilations and stuff there's also in hungary in uh there are a couple of um collectives like exas label which is also doing a, a lot of benefit uh, um compilations that help various causes in budapest uh, from supporting um women uh, domestic uh, ngos which work with domestic violence against domestic violence and homeless etc so so there's lots of um these sort of grassroots uh, musical collectives that get involved in their local public uh, sphere and and try to support it and uh, they are not funded by by i don't know they're not institutionalized they don't have an office these labels operate from bedrooms of these people who are connected uh, locally in their town they they're connected interregionally and they're connected also globally because these days of course it's not if you're a label from a village in Slovakia you you can get featured in an English magazine you can have friends in, in the same scene in America so it's it's very like there's these various levels there's this local which I think is very important it's important that that these um actors and, and and that we are also active locally and that we try to sort of change these communities and also help in terms of not only music scenes but also wider social causes and, and then there's this interregional and global and it's interesting how this how this works because it's largely self-organized there and like I mean it's it's also interesting in, in shape this other project that I work on which is a bit more structured because it's a it's a um, project that is is funded and but it's also a, a loose network of of these festivals across europe which 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 came together and they they work and try to help new artists so um, but yeah it operates differently there are lots of structures and there's lot there's lots of ways how how this differs i think i don't know if i answered yeah, what you would I think uh, Nora and Sophie. Yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's quite uh, similar to to what what Lucia said, but um, I don't know. We didn't mention the fact how we that that we create this space. It can be also affect. Uh, a rea reaction to the to the not uh, organized uh, uh, art uh, art scene or, or or foundation of art scene. So the we felt the need to 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 react and uh, no yeah. to to this uh, this situation because uh, it's not 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 the the past uh, system was was bad in Hungary uh, like uh, art funding wise, but also the current one. So. Uh, and it just arrived the question how we how we uh, organize ourselves and how how we could put together um, uh, like the, the the needed uh, fundings and as we started uh, just uh, just paying like uh, uh, monthly fees for the rent and for for our, our uh, uh, yeah so it's uh, without any uh, any help from from um, from uh, outside and now we we have this uh, 
um, foundation that helps us to to make uh, possible to to receive different grants and and things that um, um, I don't know if uh, answered the questions because uh, <laughs> um, thank you, Anna and Denmark. I'm also not sure if we're going to answer the question. It's already a while back that the question <laughs> came up. But, um, City in the Making uh, explicitly did not start out from, uh, let's say, uh, artful, uh, art or cultural um, uh, objective. It was not like it, from that point of view that it started. But um, all of us who started it had a background in culture and artistic production. And I think that uh, uh, somehow shaped at least the start of it uh, to, uh, to a large degree. I think for one is that we were uh, not so afraid to jump into the, into the dark where, because, you know, like uh, in cultural productions, you often are within, you know, like quite a short uh, timeline uh, working on, on things which are not completely known how they will, uh, how they will unfold. So this helped us somehow, especially dealing with, uh, with this field of real estate where let's say uh, we, are, we were able to come with, uh, with quite unusual proposition to, uh, to let's say these real estate owners, uh, things where they got locked up and we saw quite easily uh, a way how to get things moving again so i guess that was uh, helpful and also quite some of the people who were participating later on had the background in uh, in art and culture or design which um uh, for sure brought uh, or brings uh, talents and capacities which uh, you know which which are very helpful in these projects for one is that uh, a lot of them are not afraid to take things into their uh, into their hands, literally also the making of spaces, but also it gives a certain uh, expression uh, to it, which is not something which we've been looking for, but uh, it definitely uh, makes it recognizable from the outside. So there are a lot of like inherent uh, aspects to that. But in the end, we are speaking about uh, reformulating the, the context of housing, uh, living and working in the in the city. Um, artists also often uh, perceive themselves somehow in that aspect as, as misfits, so it, it, um, a, a lot of the things which happen there uh, help them uh, to, uh, you know, to give them space into the city, but in the city, but also uh, gave space for cultural activities in the end. And I would say also it, um, it made it easier to link to other misfits. Maybe we are not so uh, afraid to that. And I think one thing which, uh, which we didn't speak so much about is but that I think the aspect of play or of um, giving some sort of space for, uh, for, uh, for um, experimentation, for doing things where you do not immediately have a direct economic pressure or you immediately have to make an income from it or something like that is very important in, in what's going on. It's something which we, we, don't, uh, we don't speak so much about it, but I think that we all recognize that it gives a certain, a certain room to breathe and to, uh, you know, to do things which, uh, which would otherwise not be, not be possible. Annette. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's also um, uh, the case for for the Afrikaner Bank Cooperative and and Free House because uh, um, we started with art funding, so that's I think that's the other way around. We we and we used the the budget that we have uh, that we had from the from the art world to to set up this whole structure, which is self economically self sustainable uh, right now um, um, and. And still has a part of funding only for for the art, um, but we initially we used the art funding to set up this whole self sustainable economical uh, system. And I think it's really important to um, that um, that this that, that this funding uh, gave us the this space to experiment and to set it up. Um, 
and we still have to, uh, like most people that know us don't really see us as an art project anymore. Um, uh, but for us, it's still an important part of it because it's still about imagining uh, uh, how, uh, how systems could be different and, and testing it in, in real life at the same time. Um, yeah, so, and I think for us at, in this point, it's, it's really important to have a balance in different flows. Um, um, so to have our own, um, uh, the businesses that bring in their own money, but at the same time still have this space for, uh, still have funding to create space for experiment. Uh, so, yeah, that's not only something that you need in the beginning, but you need to have that permanently. Can I, I mean, mm, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also um, interest, like interesting, this, this sort of geographical differences, Eastern, Eastern Europe versus Western Europe. In Western Europe, it's the longevity and the duration of these initiatives and this can, uh, has a certain trajectory and, and it's sustainable long-term and can develop perhaps from a grassroots initiative to maybe something that's, uh, more um let's say institutionalized and in eastern europe lots lots of these sort of collectives and these uh initiatives start when when people have i don't know when they're studying and have more time or energy and don't have to sort of have this nine to six job or five to four job or whatever they work and and they have and and then a lot of these initiatives let's say in eastern europe are also finish at some point because people don't have any more energy to invest if they know that it's a hobby project and we we we're not going to get we can't survive on this we don't not going to get any funding for this and and at some point you like in your 30s and you realize yeah maybe i have to choose and maybe i have to survive and maybe that's a priority and a lot of these independent in, interesting art initiatives or culture more like culture initiatives unfortunately have like a very sort of moment when they operate and then they sort of disappear and it's a sort of very mm, yeah like there's no sort of trajectory that that could be like a longer sort of in in that sense that at least what i experience in certain countries let's say in eastern europe where there's this lack of this a systematic independent uh, cultural funding or other types of funding that could sustain these projects i must say that it's it's quite rare in the netherlands as well like we had 10 years of um short-term funding um from art institutions or art funds um but this is the first year that we have a, uh, um, uh, structural funding for four years and i think that's a really big achievement for us but it's been it's been a rocky road to here as well i like guess um, yeah but I don't know how uh, I can imagine that in um, that in Eastern Europe it, it might be even more challenging. But I just want to say that it's not very uh, common in the Netherlands to have a structural funding uh, either. Can I ask Anna and Mark to contribute to this because they have a project also in Berkeley in on similar. Uh, Basis, so they have this uh, experience of of uh, doing a common commoning project in the core and doing a commoning project in the same periphery or or in Eastern Europe. Yeah, well, yeah, they have a different uh, somehow different uh, starting points. Uh, I I would say that actually in our situation, because we are at the moment sitting in Belgrade and not in Rotterdam, we speak from Belgrade about the project in Rotterdam, but. Uh, for what we do here, uh, we have started also, uh, it, it, let's say that it's a sort of a sister project to the one in Rotterdam. We are here working on developing a, a housing cooperative uh, structure model principles and also hopefully soon also a real construction. Uh, and it starts from, from the, from, it started actually from a, a cultural center X. I saw also the Nebuisha Milikis was somewhere on the, on the, on the, sure. on the channel. It started from the cultural space and it steps out into really the territory of, of uh, 
yeah, of very different territory. I mean, of course, this imagination and the whole whole cultural background is is there, but it the the reality out there is very harsh. And I think that this uh, maybe not so much to speak about the difference, but this I think for me what is very interesting is what happens once you step out of the cultural context and try to to make this imagina imagination reality and. Uh, that's the point when you are you are meeting a very different world from the one in which we are still in the cult. If we operate from the culture context, even in any of our context, still quite sheltered. Let's say uh, there is some kind of safe environment to operate in. And once you start to negotiate, for instance, in Rotterdam with with the, the owner of these buildings that we are using on a temporary basis, uh, it becomes a very different conversation or when you are here in the city of Belgrade discussing with the city authorities who are making a housing strategy, it's also a very different context. And, and our vulnerability, let's say, coming from the field of culture and not in some way being prepared to deal with that reality, I think is something which is worth discussing. Uh, um, I mean, I don't know if we are well equipped for it, but what we uh, do is that we dare to somehow step into that territory uh, without much knowing much what that brings with itself. And in that respect, I think that the both contexts are, are, are quite similar, uh, both the, the, the Rotterdam and the Belgrade one, but of course bring a different challenges. So I think what is a uh, difference within, with, the, with the Rotterdam context, it is, let's say alternatives that we're speaking about already, there are some examples. And what when we speak about it here, there are no examples. And somehow I always hear in, in Rotterdam that there are sister organizations or groups that you can rely on or some experiences even from the past, from the squatting history and things like this. And here in, in Belgian context, much less of that. I think it, if I may intervene, I think it's a um, it's a very good uh, point to to underline this uh, uh, this discussion that we always have to have uh, uh, coming from the field of cultural position uh, and stepping out uh, um, when you don't work when you don't always work uh, within this safe net. If you, for example, try to do project in public space or to um, to have some sort of uh, artistic commissions where you need to, to dialogue with these uh, actors of, of uh, the tough uh, real life, let's say, uh, then you, you understand not only how vulnerable you are, but how um, little prepared the others are to, to have this dialogue and how little you, you mean for them, actually. So it's, it's a, like you are in no win situation, no matter what, because it's, um, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I agree that there are some points where the differences are not so big when it comes to, to how the, the real estate and the, um, yeah, the right to housing, the right to, to common resources is discussed today, both in Eastern and Western Europe and throughout the, the world. I think it it's, uh, gets more and more equalized and uh, uh, the, the disenfranchised people are uh, starting to be the same everywhere. So. Um, these differences between East and West are, are, are mostly now carried uh, on, let's say, um, some uh, uh, refined uh, uh, historical and ideological discussions. But when it comes to, to this harsh reality, uh, they, they start to, to be not so evident anymore. Uh, um, and uh, here in, uh, in Romania and um, yeah, in, some big cities like Bucharest and Cluj, there has been a movement recently um, for uh, for the, the right to, to housing, basically. And uh, this movement started with some, some very precarious people coming actually from, from the cultural field, academic and artistic. And they, they came to the support of uh, people who are evicted, especially um, poor and Roma families uh, from, uh, uh, from certain neighborhoods uh, in the city. Uh, who were evicted from their houses because of uh, we have in addition to capitalism and all this uh, <laughs> um, situation we have this law that was given um, I think in the late 90s which uh, 
uh, gave back property to, to their form own, uh, former owners before uh, nationalization. And this, this law was such a mess and a, a disaster in the way it was formulated, in the way it was implemented and in, uh, in the um, in, in inequities that it produced and in the total misunderstanding of what uh, actually property meant before the war or before uh, 1945 uh, and what it means, what it meant in the 19th century and what it means today. So we have this completely insane situations where people are asking back for uh, uh, tens of thousands of acres of, of property and the church is asking back for uh, forests and for uh, things that uh, uh, at least for a short time, uh, they, they became uh, public property or common property, let's say. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think the, the fights are to be carried from these multiple positions and uh, um, yeah, um, and um, maybe understanding that uh, com coming from this cultural field or artistic field is not only a vulnerability, but it's also a strength, uh, just like the, um, the strength that the women bring to, to certain political battles. It's uh, uh, the strength in, in the vulner vulnerability itself because it's, um, it's connected to other ways of judging the situation that that uh, are about care, about empathy. They are not always about rationalizing the uh, that specific situation and space. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was a question already in the chat, and I was also planning to to to, to ask that. Uh, but it's also highly related to either this East-West divide or, or this uh, question of uh, sustainability. Uh, so the question was that how do you perceive like the economy of commons and like basically how you, you perceive that uh, distribution of, of the act if there is a funding and if there is how how that can be used and distributed within a circle and or if there is no how these different revenues can be uh, produced within within these initiatives so like uh, in the case of transit as you step out from the from the cultural field and try a different one how that uh, bring in other resources and how that can be also again distributed in in a, in a, in a Circle of commons or common. I start with Annette. Um, yeah, I think I already mentioned it. Like our um, um, our our funding system, uh, or we have like partly funding, that, which is thirty percent and seventy percent comes just from um, uh, being a business, uh, which is. What, still a bit weird because it feels like we're playing to be a business but we are um and we uh, yeah so that we try to combine all those different uh um flows of, of money um to to keep the business running um and then in the um, uh yeah i think it's just like in the housing system it's it's like playing in the real world uh, real world uh, so we do we do tenders um, and stuff. Yeah. A nine mark. Mm, yeah. Uh, economy and commons. Um, well, maybe the first thing to mention here is that we try to do our core activities without um, uh, cultural funding. So we started with, uh, with a bunch of buildings, which we got access to uh, free of charge. And we uh, understood that if we um, get a small flow uh, of rent going on in these buildings, a revenue stream, then with that, we can basically cover uh, the, the base costs of keeping these buildings open and, uh, and running and also provide through that uh, the base uh, funding for keeping spaces for commoning and common practices uh, available free of charge. So that basically works uh, 
through the fact that we got these buildings, we don't have to pay rent on it, but we ask a little bit of rent, very friendly, for people who use it as their homes. So there is a small uh, cycle there. And we wanted to do it like that because we didn't want to depend for a uh, base sort of like housing and space issues on cultural funding. We thought cultural funding should be for cultural activities. Um, then uh, there is uh, only in this situation where uh, we got access to this uh, stretch of a street uh, and we uh, we had to, let's say, get that going in a very short time um, that we asked the owner uh, of the buildings to provide us with funding to do a sort of programming of the of the the initial programming of the of the common spaces, because there was just no time in the one and a half year which was given uh, to us to let this in a more organic way uh, uh, evolve. Because some of the other buildings we got for a period of ten years, five years, and there you have like space to to let things emerge. Uh, to let the community of, uh, of people who are in these buildings think out what are the best uh, activities and commoning uh, structures which they like to uh, to have and to take care about. But here we just didn't have the time to uh, for that. So there was actually a budget pushed into that. Um, and um, it, it is on the one hand, it is uh, something which we thought is uh, it was, was very helpful for the short term to get it going, but on the other hand, we still see it as a sort of uh, a trap to be uh, depending on uh, to, to be dependent on uh, on that. So we have been thinking um, and we've been working on a sort of like sort of economy plan, how to make such um, such uh, such such an approach working without that sort of input, because we can simply not guarantee that in the next situation we would be, let's say, in the fortunate situation to have this sort of like uh, funding. So let's say we try to keep that um, that economy of culture as much as possible on the edge, and then it, it gives, on the other hand, it gives space for uh, for uh, cultural things to develop and. If they need it, uh, they can look for their own funding, which also happens. So there are spaces which are available for commons activities, workshops, and all of that. And some of them, on their own terms, uh, look for cultural funding outside. But they don't. We don't depend on that, and they don't depend on our cultural funding to uh, to be there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, actually, uh, I just, uh, we were trying to figure out what was the question really and how to answer it because that's not really clear. So if you... Uh... So the question in the, in the, in the chat was that uh, how you understand the, and the practice of, uh, how understand and practice the economy of the commons, where the resources come from and where they should come from. Uh, and then I added to that that you were already speaking about funding, but yeah. how you can tackle that tackle that issue within the community in terms of redistribution and uh, and uh, how, what kind of practices you use to utilize differently as an outsource outside uh, institution like uh, influences or inside structures. Yeah, well, actually, it's also was really important for us, although we were uh, trying to apply for government funding before, but we didn't receive it. So it's uh, self funded, uh, as I mentioned before, and now we have like other project fundings. But uh, um, for example, we make a lot of collaboration with other organization or like nonprofit organization usually, like uh, also um, to like uh, internationally, for example, with other uh, galleries from um, Romania, or uh, there was another uh, collaboration with the um, American uh, Art History Gallery as well. So um, sometimes actually uh, they have 
fundings for their project and it's um, like we have this shared uh, expenses on the projects or exhibitions that we make and um, yeah like in long term I think we um, like after several years we uh, start to be more like a little bit more institutionalized and uh, a bit more professional in a sense. So, um, yeah, for example, we are going to have also a performance festival. It's also, uh, we apply for a project funding and um, that's how we can manage to go on. And uh, of course, now we are looking for another space to move and um, um, like, the places owned by the by the by the government as well, but uh, there is a um, um, also like a, uh, sorry like a funding for um, like a culture funding that we can um, have this place um, like on a reduced pi uh, price. So we try to work as much as can uh, uh, with these possibilities and opportunities that uh, we have. Lucia. So let's say I could maybe talk about these two projects, Eastern Days and um, Noise and Roses, this event series. So with Eastern Days, we do this event in Berlin where we get funding this year from music funds, uh, a funding body from Berlin. And then in a way, um, Eastern Days mostly was without run without any funding. And um, this event has funding, but we find it that it's um, good because it sort of redistributes this money to the musicians and we, distrib we get the mon money and we distribute it, let's say, the idea in the last years was that it's distributed, let's say, equally each collective, whether they're from the from Mars or Venus or Romania, they get the same money and then they do whatever they like with it. So, because a lot, lot of times with musicians, let's say they are an artist, they are always like the star gets huge money and then the other one gets 50 euros. So we wanted to make it a bit more democratic. Um, but with the other projects, with the Noise and Roses, with the event series, it's no funding and, 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 it's, and I'd like it to stay that way. I think it's nice that it's sort of like an underground grassroots initiative that has no connection to funding bodies and stuff. And um, yeah, then it's run by donations and the donations basically are then yeah, given to the artists and stuff. Also this like, Set, divided like everybody gets the same so it's um yeah in that sort of way i would like to answer by uh, connecting the question also to another question that you you only sent to us by email which was how we communicate with the state for example and um, um, so the, the very specific case of transit is a privileged one. So this, I don't have much to comment on it because we had structural funding since we were founded. Private money, not so much since we decided to, to share it, uh, to distribute it among us. So uh, from the beginning, we, um, we took it on us that we will function, uh, we will continue to function on, a, let's say, a uh, small basis like we used to before being uh, involved in this in initiative. Although, um, um, yeah, situations were not comparable. But anyway, so in the landscape of independent cultural institutions in Romania, we had a privileged position because of this funding, no matter how small it, it was in the end, uh, when, it, when it came to, uh, to the real numbers, but uh, it was important because it ensured this uh, continuity and this longevity, which as we were discussing earlier, is, is really not so possible in, in our context. And uh, um, the other thing is that um, because we were aware of this, uh, we, we tried to as much as possible to 
not only to, to redistribute and to support artists and to, to support other, other organizations, but also to be part of the discussions around uh, how things should be done uh, when it comes to, to other funding that comes, for, for example, from the state. So um, before the pandemic, uh, we uh, um, came together with some colleagues and established a federation of, uh, of um, independent uh, art institutions in Bucharest. And, um, and now uh, it looks like from all over the country, there are a lot of uh, NGOs and groups of NGOs from, from the cultural, independent cultural field that are coming strongly to, to the table of discussions with the state because there is this huge amount of money that came uh, from the European Union as a support for, that is meant to be support for the cultural sector. And uh, we are trying to prevent that it that is given in the way that the government knows. So it is uh, either by direct, uh, uh, how to say, so with, with no competition, yeah, by direct commissioning or by uh, a very random uh, and unprofessional uh, criteria or uh, what happens lately is that this uh, a version uh, strongly discussed also in the, uh, the level of the European Union, this version where the cultural actor is uh, equivalented with an entrepreneur. Uh, so this becomes the main mainstream, basically, of all cultural policies. And um, uh, the scheme that the Ministry of Culture proposed these days is very much emphasizing that and uh, creating this completely insane um, uh, in, um, unequal treatment of uh, uh, non-profit NGOs and businesses that are, for example, organizing the, the big festivals. So the, uh, the logic behind that is that the more money you produce, the more you will get as support from the state. And uh, those who are uh, uh, really working hard and make, producing value and, and uh, a lot of things on this, uh, um, on this level of the uh, nonprofit, um, they are really um, almost given something like charity. So, um, we, it's not yet uh, voted, so we are really struggling for this budget, also because it's, a, it's an occasion, you know, before the pandemic, we hardly had the chance to, to have this talk because there was never money. The, the cult culture uh, was always left last and, uh, um, yeah, there was basically no discussion to have. We had to, to fight for peanuts. But now there are some real budgets and we have a, an occasion to use this uh, this, uh, this stressful moment as an opportunity to make some changes that could last, to show that actually, yes, you, you have this money, but this, this, is the new, this is how it should be. You know, it's not uh, a condition. Uh, you realize that we've been, <laughs> we've been under this for the past 30 years, and only now we realize how dramatic it was because uh, people are, are willing to, yeah, to discuss it on, from a different position. So, uh, yeah, speaking of the comments, I think, uh, the, the budget of the state should be treated as commons and should, we should discuss around it as such. And um, uh, the, the, anything that we can get as an organization is, uh, is valuable as long as we sort of give it back to the whatever community we have around us or we can build around us. And also to, to give as much of, of it to, to the artists. But it's, of course, <laughs> also talking very much idealistically. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, now as it's all way, almost over, I open the floor for the questions. And we already have one. Uh, but I just try to, uh, it's really long. Yeah, uh, the question is like this, shouldn't the moment, should the, this moment of crisis could have been the possibility to rethink the role of social, pub, social and public at cultural institution and how this response of cultural sections can be understood in the practice of commons. So responding to your uh, uh, speech on, on COVID and the COVID grants, I think that's the question how the basically this whole situation is uh, restructuring the 
the idea of the cultural institutions and how uh, these practices can be understood in terms of commons. I, I just have very short uh, answer to that. Um, again, connecting it to a question that was uh, more up in the stream of the chat, uh, because Christian is asking if we can talk about a, uh, an actual practice of commoning. And uh, the question above was uh, asking or mentioning the different cooperatives that functioned during socialism and then that were completely dismantled in the years of the transition. And I think uh, we should take the time, and uh, some people are doing it, of looking at this past and these historical examples, only that uh, we should always be um, careful uh, on how to, to see them from, from the perspective of today, because uh, they, they were certainly uh, implemented in different ways. I, I don't know, yeah, probably, you know, it's different when you talk about Yugoslavia or when you talk about Romania. So we had very different situations and uh, cooperative was not understood in the same way. Uh, but it's certainly a practice that people in other fields than culture are going back to. So especially in agriculture. So this, these are the most um, uh, common ones. So um, um, I think uh, it's not only um, on the level of discourse that we are uh, talking about commoning, but on the actual uh, practical and legal way that uh, at least uh, I have very concrete examples and I hope I will be able to, to talk about them more in the near future uh, that we are also in the, in the cultural field uh, going back to these forms of of organizing and self organizing and yeah so it's uh, it's not only a discourse about it but it's actually a practice thank you maybe i can add uh, a few yeah. words um uh, Raluca was just mentioning, like going back to the past, I think what is uh, one interesting example here in uh, Belgrade, which I'm on the margins involved is, is, uh, is a magazine, which is a cultural place, which is not owned by the group of people that is using it, but it's owned by another institution, but it's, let's say, common by, uh, by almost, I don't know, over 50 organizations which are using it and managing it. Together and what I think is really uh, interesting in the context of, of Belgrade and the and the former Yugoslavia is rethinking the process of self-management, which was the let's say the the the, the state uh, mantra. not mantra, but it was the principle through which organizations were run on various levels in the time of Yugoslavia, which was then abandoned, of course, uh, from the 90s on and is now rethought and reimagined. And uh, I think that the new generation is, is here who is uh, like rethinking it from, from, from that perspective. And uh, then speaking about uh, legal and financial uh, also side of it, like as I said that we are here in, in Serbia uh, re rethinking and hopefully also soon constructing a cooperative housing but we come across a number of issues that uh, limit possibilities of collective ownership. And this is really something that, that, that is beyond, uh, let's say, our influence, something that really has to be addressed on a much higher level to be, uh, to, to be functional. So for instance, if you want to implement something which is collectively owned, it has much more taxes than if it's privately owned by individuals and, uh, this, and in quite big numbers percentages, let's say. So there is built into the system this whole obstruction to the, to the collective ownership and commoning, actually. Uh, so, so obviously some, some much bigger change has to happen uh, for, for it. And our experimentation, let's say, hopefully can inspire these changes. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other question. I mean, uh, I think as it's time, uh, I close down the event and I'm really thankful for all of you to sharing your
thoughts and experiences and uh, and also for all the participants who, who came apart from the from Facebook and here. So thank you and hope to see you soon. Thank you also. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, please save the questions because some of them we haven't answered. So it's for, yeah. <laughs> yes. for next time. <laughs>